Ways and Means and the District 9 City Councilor. Today is Monday, May 6th. No, yeah, May 6th, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we are here with our good friends from uh, the Department of Public Works and the Chief of Streets, Chris Osgood, uh, to review the FY20 Public Works budget as they pertain to dockets 0622 through 0625, orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, and appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, as well as dockets 0626 through 0628, capital budget appropriations including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks in the chamber that this is a public hearing both being broadcast and recorded on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, uh, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd ask everyone to silence their electronic devices. Uh, throughout the hearing, we will take public testimony at different uh, points in the hearing. There is a sign-in sheet to my left by the door. I ask that you state your name, uh, any affiliation, your residence, and please check the box, yes, if you do wish to testify. Uh, you can testify in uh, several ways. Uh, you can come to one of these public hearings and t give your testimony publicly. You can come to a hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, anytime from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. We will be here at least for that time frame and we'll stay as long as we need to to hear from everyone who would like to speak on the budget. You can send your testimony by mail to the Committee on Ways and Means, City Council, Fifth Floor, Boston City Hall, Boston, Mass, 02201. Uh, and you can email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. I'd like to uh, introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. Uh, we have to my immediate right, City Council. Oh, I'm sorry, Ed Flynn was here first um, from South Boston, my friend from South Boston. Um, to my right, Councilor Mike Flaherty at large. To my far left, Councilor. Josh Zakem and Councillor Tim McCarthy. Back to, over to my right, uh, Michelle Wu. Back to the left, Frank Baker. And back to my right, Anissa Sabi George. I want to thank you all. And I want to thank all of the folks you have brought to the chamber. Uh, I see Mark Cartarelli, Rob DeRosa. I see numerous people that, that deserve a lot of our thanks and praise for all the work you guys do. So thank you. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to you for your opening statements. Sure. Thank you so much, Chairman Siomo, members of the City Council. Uh, again, Chris Osgood, I'm, I'm very delighted to be here on behalf of uh, Mayor Walsh to present to you uh, the FY20 Public Works budget. I'm joined here by uh, Ann Carbone, our budget director, uh, Mike Broll, our superintendent of street operations, Parajaya Singh, uh, our city engineer, and Katie yeah, Cho, our chief engineer. Yeah. Uh, this year's recommended public works budget is $95.5 million, roughly a 10% increase over FY19. Uh, and that funding supports roughly 390 staff people to deliver uh, on two key missions for the mayor. First, to deliver exceptional basic city services, and second, to design and construct great streets. Um, I'm going to walk briefly through some of the things we got done in FY19, some of the goals for FY20. Uh, and some of the new investments uh, in, uh, in FY20, uh, starting with something which is sort of core to our work, which is snow. Uh, led by Mike Brohl, we had another successful winter. Uh, this winter, we got about three feet, a little over three feet of snow in the city of Boston. Uh, it is, was a, a winter which was very short on uh, major mega snowstorms. I think we only had one snowstorm that was above a foot, a storm on March 5th. Um, and though we did not have many of those huge mega snowstorms that uh, give cause for things like a press conference, uh, we actually had dozens of early morning snow, ice, or mixed precipitation events. Uh, and because of the incredible attentiveness and good plans of Mike Broll, of Norbert Parks, of Danny Nee, Darlene Williams, and their team, uh, those uh, events largely went unnoticed to the morning commuters because we had done a good job uh, throughout the early morning hours making sure our streets were safe. Um, our expected snow budget uh, for FY20 is around $24.8 million, uh, a slight increase uh, over the previous uh, fiscal year. 
in addition to all the work we do around snow during the winter, obviously we're focused on keeping our streets clean all year round. Uh, last year, one of the things that Mike had presented on was uh, a plan to bring more of our street cleaning services in-house. Uh, that is a service which is largely contracted out. Uh, because of that work, we saved around $148,000 uh, by bringing that, uh, more of those services in-house and continuing to deliver exceptional city services uh, across, across the entire city. Uh, this budget includes an expansion of the highway budget um, by around $800,000 uh, to really help us do more street cleaning and maintenance in some of those areas which um, our current practices make much harder to clean. Uh, we are changing our city streets uh, with things like cycle tracks in uh, the North End, uh, like temporary pop-up plazas like Council Wu and Council McCarthy visited uh, this past weekend uh, on Birch Street in Roslindale, uh, and other sort of improvements across the entire city. Um, we need to invest more in our highway division to make sure that they've got the personnel and the tools that they need to be able to actually keep those spaces well maintained um, after they're installed. Uh, in addition to that work, um, as folks know, uh, the mayor has put a lot of attention on uh, the area around Mass and Melnia. Um, every single day, multiple times a day, Public Works is out there uh, and in the areas around that. This budget also includes a $50,000 contract to uh, increase uh, cleaning services along the Melnia Cass Corridor. Uh, in addition to $150,000 for our highway uh, team to be able to maintain green infrastructure across the city uh, to build off of some of the things which we're installing in city streets like more permeable uh, surfaces. Uh, in addition to all the work around street cleaning uh, and just keeping our streets uh, free and clear of snow and, and looking beautiful, uh, our street lighting division is another place we're adding additional investment in over the course of this year, uh, led by John Yetman and Mike Donaghy. Um, we are increasing our investment uh, in some key areas thanks to uh, the advocacy of, of Councillor Flynn. Uh, we're going to be putting $650,000 into the street lighting budget uh, to be able to do a study to look at how we can reduce incidence, incidence of stray voltage uh, in our city. We're also going to be putting about a million dollars towards uh, LED uh, retrofits, swapping old uh, lighting fixtures uh, with LED fixtures to uh, retrofit about 1,300 lights across the city uh, and to upgrade uh, street lights in, uh, in parts of our city where the, the lighting has become outdated. Uh, in addition to all this, the street lighting work, our Central Fleet Division, uh, led by Bill Coughlin and Matt Bradley, who is uh, here today, uh, are continuing their, their great work keeping the entire city's fleet up and running. That includes expanding our electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, we're going to be adding four new electric vehicles to the uh, fleet hub, the citywide uh, vehicle uh, fleet sharing system uh, under Matt's work. Uh, we've done a lot to actually improve the way in which we track and manage our fleet uh, through improved GPS providers. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, piloting some new technology over the course of uh, this coming year with a, likely a partner called Mobileye to think about how we can instrument our vehicles to make driving on city streets um, uh, uh, easier for folks who are behind the wheel uh, and to reduce crashes. Uh, in addition to all that work, obviously uh, the big change within the Public Works budget is actually in the Waste Reduction Division. Um, we uh, expect that of that $9.5 million increase, almost $8 million of that, at least almost $8 million of that, uh, is because of adjustments uh, in waste reduction. Uh, as folks know, uh, the Public Works team handles the roughly 240,000 tons of waste that are generated in the households across the city of Boston, whether that's trash, yard waste, recyclables. Um, all the contracts for those services uh, expire on June 30th this year, so they're all being uh, worked through right now. And while we have not finalized all those contracts, we don't have necessarily specific numbers, um, we are looking at a significant increase um, across all four of those contracts, collections, recycling, yard waste, trash. Um, that work, uh, we think we are in a good position for the year ahead, largely because of the leadership of uh, our superintendent of waste reduction, Brian Coughlin, his team, uh, Dennis Roach, uh, Jerry Gorman, who are all here uh, today we really have a focus on how we can use those contracts uh, to actually achieve the mayor's vision and one which uh, all of you have spoken to as well of how we actually achieve a zero waste city, reduce the amount of trash we're creating, increase the amount of composting we're supporting, uh, expand the amount of recycling services that we're delivering. Uh, in addition to the work on waste, on waste reduction, uh, we also are obviously investing a tremendous amount uh, into the actual capital infrastructure of our city streets. Nowhere are we investing more than in our bridges, and our bridge program is overseen by PARA. We have 40 bridges in the city of Boston, uh, and the mayor has made it a huge focus uh, for our capital budget over the past several years and in this, year's to really, this year to really improve those bridges. We have two bridges that just wrapped up uh, uh, significant capital work, the Alfred Street Bridge in Charlestown, 
and the Mass Over Com Bridge uh, in the Back Bay. I appreciate Councillor Zakem's uh, patience on the on the Mass Over Com uh, Bridge project. In addition to that, we've got a very significant bridge project underway, uh, the North Washington Street Bridge reconstruction, which is going to be an entirely new bridge connecting essentially Charlestown, uh, the North End, uh, the Bullfinch Triangle. Uh, in addition to that, which is underway, we have a couple more, uh, two more bridges. Uh, both in Council McCarthy's district that are going to be starting up uh, shortly, uh, the reconstruction of the Dana Ave Bridge, and then some work not on the bridge itself, but around the Father Hart Bridge to just improve safe traffic flow in that particular area. And then we've got three more major bridge projects that are in design, uh, the Long Island Bridge, the Northern Avenue Bridge, and the Dalton Street Bridge, all of which PAR is working on. In addition to all of those bridge, those specific projects, um, this particular capital budget also increases the amount of money we're spending on just routine capital repairs. Um, knowing that one of the best ways that we can achieve a state of good repair is just to regularly do that, those critical uh, uh, sort of elements of investment which PAR's team is overseeing. Uh, in addition to all the bridge work, um, PAR's team is also working on a series of uh, reconstructions of, of major roadways in the city of Boston. This year we are, uh, we will be finishing up Summer Street uh, in the Fort Point Channel, we'll be finishing up North Square uh, in the North End, uh, we'll be uh, breaking ground on Beach Street uh, in, uh, in the Leather District, um, and we'll be uh, starting some additional uh, planning work on key corridors uh, that we'll talk about no doubt tomorrow, uh, things like Columbia Road, uh, Blue Hill Avenue, uh, Cummins Highway, Center Street, uh, among others. Uh, in addition to all of the, uh, that reconstruction work and the bridge work, um, we do a tremendous amount of just investing in those key neighborhood basics, um, really led by Katie Cho, um, our, our chief engineer. Um, under Katie's team, we'll be uh, resurfacing roughly 40 lane miles of roadway across the city of Boston, uh, making sure that streets across the entire city and every single neighborhood um, are smooth uh, and, and safe to be on, no matter whether you're walking, biking, or driving. Uh, in addition to that work, we are also going to be uh, investing in ways in which we coordinate our capital work better. Um, as uh, Councilor Siomo mentioned in the beginning, a lot of that work is done by Mark Cartarelli, um, and we are going to be looking at the, the technical coordinating system we use to coordinate all of our utility work uh, going forward uh, in this budget as well. Um, this budget puts actually even more money, uh, though, into sidewalks than we have in previous years, and that includes about $200,000, which goes to support Mike's team to do really important uh, sort of spot repairs um, that um, we hear from all of you and from residents across the city, uh, as well as roughly uh, $2 million additional uh, to Katie's team to invest in the reconstruction of whole side knock, sidewalk networks, uh, places like Orchard Gardens and Savin Hill are places that we're going to be taking on over the course of this year. Um, so this budget, in many ways, I think helps del deliver on those two fundamental objectives that the mayor has uh, for this team and that I know that you share, ensuring that we're delivering great basic city services for our residents uh, and that we're designing and building uh, terrific streets in our neighborhoods and for our entire city. Um, in closing, I want to I end where uh, Councillor Asiomo, you, you, you led off, which is really to thank uh, the, uh, all of you for your partnership in this effort, to thank uh, the women and men who I'm joined with here, the women and men who are, here, who are uh, up in the, in the gallery, and honestly, most importantly, the women and men who can't be here today because they are out on the streets just delivering the basic city services we all depend on. So yeah. thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Is that it for you? That's it. Thank you. Um, let me also add to that list the field folks, D4 in my district, John Shalmo and Chad, very responsive, and Eric Prentice, my liaison. Just want to give those uh, folks a shout out. Um, so let me, I, I wanted to uh, first ask, what is the balance of the snow budget that we didn't use this year? So we are still working through a final number, in part because uh, it is shared across multiple departments. So there's some departments that draw from that roughly $24 million line item that do not include public works. And we are uh, going to be investing in some necessary uh, uh, repairs to things like our salt sheds and investments in our plowing equipment. Uh, so we don't quite have a final number yet. Um, but it'll, ballpark? <laughs> it'll likely be under the 24, but we d I don't have a ballpark yet. Okay. So we can get uh, when you get that, if you could Absolutely. pass it along, I'd appreciate it. Yep. Um, and then uh, just to dive right into the, uh, the waste reduction, I want to, you know, commend the, the mayor's commitment to recycling. But, you know, again, as um, someone who came here in 2008 before single stream, we all had to, you know, divvy up all our glass and plastic and paper. And we thought we'd see a, a great increase in recycling. Could you kind of dive into that a little, um, Chris? Sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, our our diversion rate uh, is, or the amount of uh, our trash that we recycle is roughly 20, 21, 22 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so we generate about 240,000 tons of trash. We recycle about 40,000 tons of that. Um, we know that we've got a huge opportunity to do more. Um, of the 200,000 tons that we throw away, um, Roughly 30% is compostable and roughly 30% is recyclable. We know there's a huge amount of food waste, yard waste, uh, and recyclables that are in that waste stream. And that is why the mayor, uh, a year ago, uh, kicked off an effort in collaboration with uh, the Environment Department and this department uh, to create a zero waste plan, which we'll be releasing over the course of the spring, which has a series of recommendations about how we can actually uh, increase our recycling uh, numbers and increase our composting numbers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some things that are in this budget which actually allow us to take some steps in that direction. Uh, yard waste is one, I think, very good example of that. Um, so again, if you look at that 200,000 tons that we are throwing away, 30% of that's compostable and a good chunk of that is actually yard waste. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to change, we're going to in significantly increase the amount of days that somebody can actually drop off yard waste at this, in the city of Boston this year. Uh, right now there's 18 weeks a year, 18 weeks a year that we do yard, curbside yard waste collection. We're going to be increasing that through this budget to 20 weeks of yard waste collection, mm -hmm. plus uh, on at least 20 additional weeks we're going to have a place that residents can actually drop off their yard waste mm -hmm. um, so that for most of the, the year, if not the entirety of the year, we're going to have a way in which we can take yard waste out of trash bags and get it to a place where it can be composted and as folks may know, that then, uh, once it gets composted, it actually gets returned to uh, community gardeners across the city of Boston to mm -hmm. actually support community gardening in our city. Great. Uh, let me uh, recognize uh, Councilor Andrea Campbell who joined us at the beginning of your presentation. So uh, help me understand how the um, contract yeah. for trash it was able to go up so significantly when we're under contract with them. So there are, the, all four contracts, all four main contracts expire on June 30th. So mm -hmm. the number which is in this budget is for all the contracts that start on July okay. 1. Right. Um, we, um, while uh, I would say in terms of total dollar value, um, that is really being driven by three of the contracts. And as we go through the contracting process, we, we can, which we are not, we have not finalized yet, we can get you uh, the exact numbers. Um, but we spend roughly half of our budget on the, on the collection side. This is simply paying contractors to pick up uh, the uh, trash, yard waste, and recyclables and take them to uh, their final destination. Uh, and then, and that is, we're seeing an escalation in that uh, just simply uh, due to some of the, the overall changes in that market. Second, we're also seeing an escalation in the cost of where we take our actual trash. And there's some limits within the state. There are, are fewer waste energy plants and fewer landfills, or less capacity, I should say, uh, likely in the long term. Uh, and the state, and we're seeing some of the results of that limited capacity on the pricing that we've received in this year's bids. And we've also seen an escalation uh, on recyclables as well, again, largely driven to some uh, national and international factors around recycling. All right. I don't know, Mike, if there's anything you want. So, uh, and I think, would you say the recycling part of the contract is gone? I mean, I think we used to actually make money or right. offset. That's correct. Right. So what's the percentage that that's going up now? Uh, so I don't have a final number yet. I, absolutely, in terms of percentages, that is the most significant increase. In terms of uh, absolute value in terms of dollars, uh, we'll likely see a greater increase in both collections and potentially in the drop-off of trash mm -hmm. more than uh, more than recycling. But recycling has gone up uh, significantly. To your point, two years ago we probably made money. Two falls ago we made money on the on uh, recycling, which meant that we actually uh, received revenue back. Um, that does not look like uh, the situation we are going to be in, at least at the beginning of this contract. Uh, we're seeing two changes. One is that the contamination rate, uh, uh, that the, the, I should say the processing cost for recyclables, uh, is, is going up. Um, the industry is, is looking for um, uh, lower amounts of trash mixed with recycling when, that, when those recyclables are sold. And because they're looking for that lower percentage of contamination, the actual cost of processing recyclables has gone up. Um, second, uh, it seems as though there's less of a, uh, a market demand for, uh, for the recyclable mm. products themselves, and so we're getting less revenue um, back in our revenue share contracts. Okay. Um, before I pass it on, I, I received a 
a note from one of our colleagues. I regret that I am unable to attend today's hearing on the Committee on Ways and Means FY20 Public Works budget as one of the city's top five departments spending money on contracted goods and services. I hope to hear what the department plans to do to contract with more local women and, and persons of color owned business. Uh, sincerely, uh, Councillor Kim Janey. Thank you. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Siomo, and thank you to the panelists for being here. I started off the day on Saturday in the, in the South End, Chinatown, in the Bay Village, um, with Levia Block, with uh, Eric Prentice and, and Danny Nee, but there was a, a, a worker there from Public Works. His name was Louis Arwuhu. He's doing an outstanding job, very, very professional. And before that, I saw another man in, in Chinatown. His name was Vincent. I didn't catch his last name, but he was sweeping the streets on Tyler Street. And Tyler Street looked very good because of Vincent's uh, professionalism, along with, along with Lewis. Um, so I just wanted to pass that along to you first. You. Um, and Chief, I know you highlighted at the beginning the um, improvements to Long Island, yep. um, Northern Avenue Bridge, and the um, North End Charlestown Bridge. What's the latest um, on the Northern Avenue Bridge? Sure, uh, and Parr can speak to this as well. Um, we have a, a mayor's advisory task force, of which uh, you're a member, as is Council Flaherty, uh, and we are going through uh, essentially a, um, the initial design, really looking at four key elements. Uh, with this bridge, uh, we've heard from residents that there are four main objectives. One, we want to improve mobility. We know we want a better connection, opportunity to have a better connection between downtown and the South Boston waterfront, particularly as the South Boston waterfront gr grows. Second, we know that we need to improve resiliency. It was a year and a half ago, uh, a little less, that uh, the four-point channel actually rose to meet the bottom of the current Northern Avenue Bridge, uh, that the next, that our investment in the Northern Avenue Bridge we know needs to actually um, raise that span in order to be able to prepare for sea level rise. Uh, third, we know we want to be able to honor history. The, the outline of the bridge, the method of construction of the bridge, the way in which the bridge move, moves is uh, something which is beloved by by many constituents, uh, and we want to figure out the right way to honor history with the Northern Avenue Bridge investment. And then fourth, we have heard, perhaps above all, that there's an opportunity to create a destination there at the mouth of the Four Point Channel. Um, those four objectives, mobility, history, resiliency, and placemaking, are essentially what the Mayor's Advisory Task Force is working through right now. PAR's team has led um, a whole series of design efforts, uh, and we have, on May 23rd, our next task force meeting, and we expect in early June uh, to have a meeting, a public meeting, uh, to really talk about uh, two key elements, uh, what the actual design, the overall design of the bridge looks like and the width of the bridge with really an eye towards uh, history and resiliency. Anything you'd... Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that update. Um, I also know that you are investing in, in South Boston as well, especially on issues relating to pedestrian safety. That's um, yes. very important to me in my, in my district as well. I also represent the downtown neighborhood and the downtown bid provides exceptional investments in our city i believe last year they contributed over 200 million dollars in property tax alone um, how is the city leveraging this private investment in terms of infrastructure improvements or for city services. We may hear directly from them in a moment. I'm mindful that, uh, that Rosemary can totally correct this, but I think that we've got a fantastic uh, collaboration uh, with the bid. Um, Mike can speak to this and Katie can speak to this, but I think there's a very good working relationship uh, looking at some of those basics. Uh, and one of the projects, uh, in addition to sort of uh, just keeping the, uh, the downtown crossing area being that uh, sort of looking terrific, we are making a, a whole series of investments in what I would consider sort of the gateways to uh, the downtown crossing bid. So last year, the mayor cut the ribbon on the new Liberty Tree Plaza, which was done in collaboration between the Parks Department, the Downtown Crossing Bid, and Para, uh, PARA's team. Uh, we are shortly going to be doing some work at the uh, Harrison, uh, Essex, uh, and uh, Tremont Street intersection uh, to figure out, to basically create a new gateway there uh, that both sort of creates a new public plaza. Uh, both for downtown crossing uh, and for Chinatown. Uh, and then we've got money in our capital budget uh, to be able to uh, improve Winter Street. Uh, it, some long asked for design and construction improvements uh, that the bid has been looking for that uh, Katie and Paris team are going to be working on. Yeah, thank you. It's one of the busiest areas in the city, um, especially MBTA riders using that area, South Station, Washington Street, uh, Park Street. 
the capital plan, $500,000 was allocated for design improvements to the Washington Street summer yep. winter street intersection. Uh, what is the status of that project, and um, is it on schedule? So we have some work to do to get to uh, jumpstart the design, and we're meeting this afternoon with the bid uh, to talk specifically about okay. that. Okay. Yeah, if, if I could stay updated yeah, um, on that as well. Um, again, just want to highlight the tremendous work of the public works um, personnel that are, are doing exceptional work across the city, and they're really the workers that keep our city moving forward. They, they, um, they do the work. They don't get huge salaries, but they work hard. They're determined, they're professional, and um, I'm, proud, I'm proud of their work that they provide for the residents of Boston. And I think my time is up, but I'll, I'll, I'll catch up on the next round. That's good. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Chief, and to the team, not just that are sitting here in front of us, but I, I know the folks in the gallery here that are all the unsung heroes for the various uh, departments that uh, get the job done. So it's a pleasure to work, obviously, with Mike on a regular basis with snow removal and trash collection and sidewalk and pothole repair. Um, been super responsive, uh, Chief, anytime my office or staff has reached out to, to, to you, Mike. So a uh, compliment to you and to your team, uh, particularly. I uh, want to pick up, obviously, as we start the recycle with Michael season, um, talk about the recycling contract that's gone up yes. considerably. Yes. There was a report done, one of the news stations reported that people are just putting regular household trash in with recycling. What are we doing about that? Is that, a, is that the role that inspectional services should be playing in conjunction with public works? Should we be ticketing, feeing, fining folks in, that are using the recycling bins for regular household trash? It's, it seemed to be, the report was very disappointing uh, that they did. I don't know if it was a spotlight report, but yep. they went right to the recycling facility, and uh, you saw there was so so much of that um, product, as you mentioned, was contaminated. Mm -hmm. yep. It had a lot of other stuff other than the recycle. So I guess what are we doing? I know that we put out some ads. Um, I don't know how much those ads cost. I don't even know who we're advertising to, but I guess what are we going to do? Because if, if the contamination rate continues and if the, there's less right. market demand, on recycling, we're in a real precarious position here as to what to do. So, what are your thoughts? So, uh, I, we absolutely agree with you that one of the most important things we can do is to reduce the contamination rate and encourage residents to recycle right. Um, there is a statewide effort led by DEP around recycling right, which Mike's team, Brian, Jerry, Dennis have all been uh, working on. That is, uh, that in collaboration with Chris Coakley has been some of the uh, initial sort of outreach uh, that you've seen. Uh, we're boosting our community outreach, our education, our advertising on things like Big Belly Trash Cans to get the message out about how to recycle right, again, to lower that contamination rate. We know that actually is better for the environment and better for the bottom line. Um, there is, uh, I would say sort of in, in, in addition to uh, sort of that core work around education, one of the key things that uh, was done uh, by the mayor uh, a couple of years ago was to bring the code enforcement division over from the inspectional services right. division to actually work directly in the waste reduction division. So there's an opportunity to think about how our code enforcement team can be part of that educational uh, collaboration to make sure that people know what is recyclable uh, and that we're putting the right things in the blue barrels uh, and putting the right things in trash bags. And as you know, on street cleaning day, we're real yeah. quick to ticket, to tag, to tow. Um, our inspection service workers should be right out there with the trash collection folks and lift up those blue yep. bins. And when there's food in there, that homeowner uh, ought to be being cited. So um, yep. it should be on par with, you know, getting uh, the street sweeper to the curb. We put a big emphasis on that. Yep. Uh, to the point where we've increased fees and fines, uh, uh, particularly around uh, on the street cleaning piece. But this is this is huge. When you when you Agreed. see our recycling cost uh, go up significantly in a, in a very period, short period of time, we need to put an emphasis on that. And I think that's going to require our inspection service department to be out on the street alongside of our meter maids and our tow trucks, and this be a joint effort to try to crack down on this. I don't think the ads are working, quite frankly. And I don't think people are really tuned into what they should be putting in the blue bins and what they should not be putting in the blue bins. We do get a lot of calls in my office for people looking for blue bins. I'm not quite sure if we're still distributing those blue bins, and if so, are we doing it neighborhood by neighborhood, or can people call in and just get a blue bin? But um, if we get some clarity on that, that'd be great. So that actually uh, connects back with uh, the letter that you read from Councillor Janey. So one of the things, to Brian's credit and Ann's credit, that we did uh, through this particular capital budget is we actually pulled out the, uh, the blue bin, the recycling cart delivery process. Uh, in the past, that was tied in with one of our larger uh, uh, 
larger trash contracts. We pulled that out as a separate contract, as I think that uh, many of you heard about on Thursday's hearing, last Thursday's hearing from Economic, Devel Economic Development Group at, a, at the mm -hmm. hearing that you shared. Um, we are taking a different approach this year. It is a separate uh, contract as a smaller dollar uh, contract geared specifically towards a smaller local uh, business um, who can actually deliver carts. And in the past, we would deliver carts eight months a year, and this, in this coming mm -hmm. fiscal year will actually be year round. So all 12 months, we'll actually be delivering uh, recycling carts okay. to residents that are interested. Right. And if we can just do a better job of tracking what's going into those bins and taking appropriate action. Yeah. For those that are not putting recyclable goods into those, that'd be uh, that's important. The overtime budget that looks like we appropriated 2.3 and 1.8 has been used. That leaves us a surplus of 500,000 over the next couple of months. What drives the overtime cost? Is it the snow removal, uh, trash collection stuff, or is it? It's snow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Be, uh, department, but uh, for your uh, weekend cleanups, your neighborhood cleanups, um, street lighting work with capital um, and some. Um, other work that they'll be doing just to uh, maintain their, their, okay. their assets. Um, for the most part, though, I would say that it's fleet maintenance and um, the highway division would be the, would be the bulk of that work. Right. And then, uh, Chief, I can just shift back to the uh, follow-up on Council Flynn's comments on the Northern Avenue Bridge. I know yep. that there's a pretty wide, uh, there's, a wide um, there's a wide gap there. So I think we need to, Correct. do we, wa do we want to be a super, do we want to be a salad? We can't be both. So right. I think we've got to tighten that up to go Great. from sort of a 50 to a 160. We have some explaining to do, so if we're going to be, if we're going to be approving this budget, um, I'm going to kind of need to know sort of what that real number is mm -hmm. because that range is just so wide, um, and also to be very clear as to what those uses were. I know there was a yeah. article I think it was in the last week or so, um, but the city's position we really weren't firm and concrete as to what that bridge was going to be used for. Uh, we can't be all things to all people. We got to really be clear, clearly defined. Uh, the scope of that bridge, the size of the bridge, and the cost of that bridge, and just be upfront and frank with people uh, and what those uses are going to be. I, I don't think we can start to continue to tiptoe around it. So so if we can tighten up um, 50 to 160, it's a huge difference, and also the, 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 the uses that are on that bridge, and we state that publicly, um, that, would, that would be, I think, that more than appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Baker. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, Chris, will you talk about, you said you had a $50,000 contract for Mass and Cass. Is that yep. for, for, just for your department to spend within, to, for cleaning down there? It's, it's really specific to the actual sort of lawn areas along Melnia Cass. Uh, this was something which was put together by, uh, by Eric Prentice in collaboration with Mike and Ann. To figure out how do we actually maintain the lawn, pan, the, the lawn areas of Melnia Cass as an additional set of services on top of everything else we're doing. Okay, so so not not really not really mass, more more Melania Cass. More Melania Cass. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, and, and you talked about <clears throat> the, the yard waste to drop off. Where would that drop off be? At the American Legion Highway site. With at Bruce's. I don't know if Bruce is still there, but at his site. Exactly. Are we um we talk is he able to sell any product over there yet or it's all just community gardens? So he is able to sell in this what we bid out this time is we actually made it very clear that contract that whoever has the contract has the right to be able to actually sell uh, anything above, I think it was 1,200 cubic yards, um, anything above the, the threshold that, that goes out to the community gardeners. Yeah. And just as another way of being able to manage costs and also provide a compost back to residents who may want it. And, and what are you seeing with, with him over there? Is, uh, like are his numbers for yard waste staying the same year over year? Are they increasing? They'll be increasing. Uh, with this year we definitely think because we'll have more curbside days of collection plus the weekend drop-off opportunities, yeah. we're definitely going to see so more yard waste. expecting an increase exactly. this year. That's correct. Uh, we bought a couple of Polaris sweepers. We, we yeah. explained. Are they the small sweepers, the regular size sweepers? What are they? So they're, they're small utility. Um, you did, did look like little um, four by fours with the with the hopper in the back to, to, that they could throw material out of. But ultimately, we bought them with brooms and plows. Uh -huh. uh, we brought three of those and utilized them on um, Summer Street, uh, Melnia Cass, all these different bike lanes that have both have been here and popped up. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, we also bought two what they call Avant. Uh, machines there. You'll see them, they're green, they look like small backhoes, but um, they have um, different attachments that allow us to push, broom, oh, and throw. Sweepers on those yep, also? yep. And plows? They're all 12 month uh, pieces of equipment, so we're able to uh, and, use and them. And will they be on, like, sometimes the city vehicles get, get beat up, regular maintenance yeah, on those? Most definitely. In house regular maintenance? These were all given to us 
the ideas by Matt Bradley and Billy Coughlin. Um, so it, the genesis of all these purchases have been have been driven by them. They're the ones who support that uh, maintenance. Yeah, yeah. And, yep. and they're, and they're in -house. seeing the maintenance. In-house, yep. Good. Um, the, the, the tow contracts, you guys working with BT, BTD at all on, on any of the, uh, I know that you're, so you guys have tow truck drivers. They, they don't have anything to do with BTD. They're just within your within your ranks. So we have one or two um, large, with the, they're called wreckers. Um, yeah. We, we, we actually got one last year. We had, I think we, we, we purchased a used model last year. So we have two drivers for that. Those are for basically in-house tows of our large plows. So they also tow, um, I think, for EMS and Boston Public Schools as well. So they can they can tow large-scale pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. but, but for the most part, all those tow operators are still sitting in BTD. Yeah. Would you use those guys at all if 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 you if you had like, can you start using those guys at all if you if you need smaller vehicles? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a it's a it's a conversation with um, Commissioner Rooney, but I think that's yeah. Okay. Very wise. Chris, what does that, what does your work for like in public? In, Mike, you'll yeah. probably hear on this too. What does a public works workforce look like? And this could can trickle down to parks and 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 transportation, all of our departments that are, are forward f facing. What what is the next? four or five years look like? Do we see like what's happening in the police department where a lot of retirements, and if so, what does that look like? And are we training anybody to come in? It, what is the pathway to get into public works, transportation, and uh, that sort of thing? Are we, look, are we looking at the future at all? Sure. So, so I'll just shepherd on the on the um, operational piece. We've been taking in this body approved the budget last year. We got six full time Hokies. Mm -hmm. That's that full time position that cleans the streets. It used to be something where all our current supervisors started off in 15, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so that feeder system has helped. Out of the six that we hired in last year's budget, five have been promoted. Have moved up in yeah. the ranks. Um, so as far as your question about the uh, maybe an aging workforce um, in highway. Um, we're probably city standard, I bet. Um, we've got. Which is, which, what is the city standard? I would, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of gray at making it look yeah. like gray, but um, I, think we're, I think we're young. I think a lot of our longer term employees will tell me that we're very green, that we've, that we've got a lot of new employees that we've got to continue to um, improve and manage up um, to just get to know that 30 year long history of you know, historical knowledge. Um, I think that we're, as far as the retaining of employees, um, we are we we do have some titles in some positions that that that, that makes it difficult for us to retain um, We get folks in with their CDL or help them get their CDL and a lot of times we lose them to a water and sewer um, a private entity um, After they get their CDL. Yeah um, So we've we've had ongoing conversations about how we can maintain those employees whether they start at a higher rate Whether we talk to the union which which we have started that whole dialogue just to you know, I always say a, a a large spreader in a snowstorm is $280 an hour contracted. It's on overtime, it's $33 with a city bought, yeah. right? So yeah. the more we, so I, I guess that's where I'd say is our largest issue right now as far as maintaining. And, and, and it isn't that, with the, that they're aging out or uh, retiring, it's that they're just, it's just holding them here with, at, the, at the current pay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so basically, our only in is the Hokie pro is the Hokie program. Or I would add one other or a pair of others. Uh, both Par and Katie are um, have co-ops that we use. We we hire co-ops as a sort of engineering pipeline. Mm -hmm. And then the Office of Workforce Development created a City Academy program. I think I'm calling it the right thing. City Academy program that uh, that Trish Casey, uh, Bill Coughlin, Matt Bradley all worked on to basically create training programs for some of the entry level jobs. Theirs focus specifically on. Uh, as Mike referenced, sort of CDL uh, and other sort of licenses you may need for careers. So we've developed works. a program with with workforce development. Yes, yes we were actually one management. of the first. Correct me if I'm wrong. We were we were one of. Thank you. Not, not, we were one of the first uh, sort of city departments working on exactly that. And then uh, our Mike just reminded me our central fleet. Uh, team has a really good partnership with Madison Park. They've cultivated that over a number of years and have hosted a whole host of interns uh, to learn that career uh, and potentially then come work for us in the city. Okay. Um, I saw a, a, a Glover's Corner. Is that is that all, Katie, is that all the, the sidewalks we talked about up by High Street and all that? You. It is, yes. So we'll, um, that is out to bid actually starting today. Um, okay. So that will be constructed um, probably beginning this season. All up by the Mather in, in, in that, Correct. that that neighborhood. Okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Zakem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have a couple, uh, just a couple things. Um, first, um, 
the trash uh, collection contract. Yes. Uh, where where are we on that? I've actually gotten quite a few um, letters, uh, calls from constituents um, who are thrilled with the current uh, our current contractor and asking where we are on uh, on reviewing that, renewing. Can you speak to that? Yep. So we're going through the actual sort of contract award process right now, so mm -hmm. we can have an update you on the, on the specifics. I think shortly. Um, I think. No matter what, um, we take a lot of pride and uh, pay a lot of attention to making sure that uh, trash collection, recycling collection, yard waste collection is done really well, uh, regardless of whoever the contractor is. Uh, and there's a number of things, both uh, structural and operational, uh, that I think allow that to be the case. One of the, we already touched on, moving code enforcement over to public works is one way in which we've, I think, really boosted our ability to ensure that trash collection is done well. Uh, second, uh, we have, and in this coming contract, uh, we are, uh, putting a higher level or higher standard in place uh, for uh, the use of GPS on all mm -hmm. trash collection contracts, make sure that we can manage them better. Um, third, we made it much clearer the fines that would be associated with failing to do certain contract provisions. And fourth, I would give a lot of credit uh, to Mike, to Brian, to Dennis, to Jerry, uh, to their team uh, for, uh, uh, for really managing these contractors uh, well. Uh, in your in your district and for all, all this is one of the things which will, I think, help have trash on the curb less and be able to get us through the city faster. We're going to be adjusting the start times sure. for trash collection down to 6 a.m. What, um, well, I guess, I mean, I know there's more than one bidder and I know that the current one, Sunrise, um, you know, has, I think, done a fine job. And what provisions, you mentioned, you know, GPS performance, I mean, are there penalties for... Yeah that and obviously is your department the enforcing agency for lack of a better word or is that something that's going to have to you know work its way through the law department or anything else i mean I, enforcement and standards is, is critical i think particularly in the denser neighborhoods like uh, Councilor flynn uh shares uh in some of the areas that we share particularly at beacon hill um, downtown back bay in the alleys so could you could you speak to that yep. we have a uh and mike can talk to this too but in this contract we spell out very clearly um the standards you'll be held to and the penalties associated with failing to meet those standards, um, and those would be and will be enforced by Public Works. Um, I do think uh, one of the reasons why we've seen some significant improvement over the last five years also has to do with your constituents. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have done formed some really great partnerships across the city uh, to make sure that trash is being put out in a great way, recycling is being put out in a great, a great way. So I think that all of that will sustain itself regardless of what contractor we select for next next. Well, uh, I would just, uh, on this topic, just, you know, I know folks... Uh, don't want to go back to, I think, the, the prior contractor. They like how things are now. Obviously, um, if that's a fiscally responsible decision, um, the results um, are incredibly important in holding whoever it is accountable. Agreed. Um, second unrelated issue, I know I'm on the clock over here. Um, the sandwich board uh, pilot program that we have uh, in the city of Boston. I know Councilor Flaherty and I have spent some time on it with Commissioner Christopher. Um, right now, uh, I have concerns about Newberry Street uh, yep. in particular, and it's been going on. I took a walk with Commissioner Christopher, actually, with some neighbor, her, neighbors the other day. It seems like, one, even given the current ordinance, which I'm not a supporter of, um, probably 80 to 90 percent of the signs don't comply with that, on Newberry Street at least. And, you know, code enforcement is empowered, um, your department, to go and Correct. pick them up off the street. Um, it's a pretty basic standard. I would like to change that rule and eliminate them altogether on Newberry Street, but that's for a different day. Um, can you speak to that? And is 311 the best way? Are you, how, how are you responding to those complaints? Uh, it is. And Mike can talk to us, too. I think probably after your conversation with Commissioner Christopher, he reached out to us. Right. Um, we uh, we're delighted to sit down with you. I think part of that is about educating all of the uh, small business owners along Newberry Street about what the regulations are. Uh, and then to take the appropriate actions through code enforcement if they fail to, uh, to fail to follow. Always 311. 311 will drive all of our work. Yeah. So I, I will say, I would hope and I would ask actually that your department, if there's 311 complaints, to go out and just pick up the signs. I don't, I'm not advocating a, a sweep without more education, and I have talked to the both business associations for that area, um, and I know they're in touch with both the Neighborhood Association, Commissioner Christopher, probably some of your folks, but. Uh, when people are actually making the reports, if they could go and get picked up, I see your employees, I see your team out there doing a great job of emptying the trash and recycle bins along Newberry Street. Um, it is a bit of a burden um, to businesses, but these the law, the rules are pretty clear. I think overly lax <laughs> on this front. Um, but even given that, you know, we saw 
advertisements for cigarettes, which are explicitly prohibited. Yep. Um, the vast majority of the signs did not have the business um, address, phone number on it as required. So I am going to be using 311 myself uh, to report these. I know many of our residents are um, in concert with education. I know the Architectural Commission is also looking at sending some other standards to try and address this. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate this is probably unique to this street. Mm -hmm. um, the program seems to be working well. I don't get any complaints about it in Mission Hill um, or the Fenway or even so much in Beacon Hill. Um, but it's the crowds um, and the proliferation given that on Newberry Street we have a, a building with maybe 30 feet of 40 feet of frontage and four, four businesses in it on a sidewalk that's, you know, this big and particularly on the weekends when you have hundreds, thousands of people, which is great, um, but we need to do that. So I will um, continue to use 311 and ask that uh, prompt responses there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I failed to mention one other person uh, from a Code Enforcement, Steve Tankle, that Absolutely. does some of the most difficult work with homeowners and other issues in neighborhoods. So, uh, Councillor McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My old department, I always love this, uh, I always love this hearing because I always generally have good things to say. Uh, but I do want to start out with the, some thank yous. Uh, uh, these are really my go-to people who um, always pick up the phone, Saturday, Sunday, doesn't matter. Um, Mark Cottarelli, Eric Prentice, uh, Zach Wathmuth, uh, Dennis Roach, Freddie Mycroft, uh, Chris Coakley, Kevin Linsky, and of course Steve Tankle. Um, literally, uh, at any event, any time of day, I can always send a shoot them a text and I get an answer back. And I don't think people realize uh, how hard uh, people work behind the scenes, not just uh, from, from 8 to 4 or 8 to 7 to 3, whatever the working hours are. So just a couple of things. I want to thank Para, especially for um, all of the uh, the upgrades coming to uh, to Reedville and, and High Park, Dane Ave Bridge, uh, Dane Ave High Park intersection, Walcott intersection. Uh, you know, well over two million dollars for the at that intersection, four million dollars for the bridge. Uh, this has been a long time coming uh, for that area, and um, I'm very happy the fact that this administration, uh, with the leadership of Chief Osgood, has really focused on. Uh, capital improvements, things that you can see and things that you can touch. Um, and that's, uh, it, it's been so important. I think it's been lacking. And uh, over the last five years, it's really uh, turned around. Um, just a couple, th couple thoughts. Um, uh, thoughts on uh, crosswalks. Um, you know, over the last five, six years, I've been kind of talking about uh, getting rid of those wagon wheel crosswalks because they, they okay. fade in about an hour and a half. Yes. Um, uh, have we, and they're expensive to repair when utility cuts yes. go through. And I know Mark Cotterelli is on the utilities to try to repair them as is, but we all know there's a 15 by 15 patch put over them and they never come back. Um, have we looked at new crosswalks and, and what kind of materials we could be using uh, for the future to, to stay away from the wagon wheel? Uh, so Par and Katie can certainly correct me on this, but we are going to the white lines, not to the wagon wheel uh, design going forward. Uh, it will, I think, probably talk even more about this in the BTD hearing tomorrow, but the mayor did step up the crosswalk uh, restriping investment, uh, and we've done, I believe, about 1,200, I'll get you the exact number, about 1,200 restriping of crosswalks over the course of this last year. Um, and it's roughly, I think, around a $2 million annual investment. That, but I'll get you the specific numbers. Uh, and again, one of the things that Katie uh, and Mark focus heavily on is exactly the issue you raised. After a cut, don't just put the, don't just resurface it nicely. Also, fix the inductive loops if they were broken and uh, do the repainting. Okay. So while we're on utilities, I'll skip. I've got them all in order. But I mentioned uh, to Katie before, I just want a, a little bit of, just to put it on the table, uh, Sanford Street, Danny Road, where Ernest is, um, I know it's a private way, but over the last 30 years, uh, it literally grew up, I grew up down the street, that's where we used to play wiffle ball and street hockey. You can't play street hockey there. It's almost undrivable because the utilities have dug it up so much. So if we can look into <clears throat> whether we patch and repair or, or just repave that little section, um, it literally is, it's, there's a seven inch puddle in the middle of the street now. I think frogs are gonna move in at some point in time if we don't do something. And it's absolutely the utilities. And I know that uh, working in District 8 as long as I did, even plowing that area is tough because the blades go right over. You know, I mean, you know the deal. Um, so if we could take a look at that. Um, thoughts on, um, on repairing um, heaving sidewalks and new materials for tree pits? Are we looking into anything that could possibly be new? Because we, we've been dealing with this for forever. 
uh, where um, yep. you know we, we come in with the temporary repair with the blacktop and then people yell at you for doing the temporary repair with blacktop. So three separate things on that. Um, first, last year we piloted in, in Council Siomo's district along Brighton Ave mm -hmm. uh, for a number of blocks, essentially a, a new type of tree pit fill, which sort of gets at some of this, allows for sort of water to be able right. to um, get through yeah, to We the have roots. those at Blackstone too, right? It's the same yeah, type of material? Same sort of, okay. uh, exactly. Um, so that's one piece. Second, um, one of the new investments in this budget is around $200,000 to support Mike Manning's team, uh, Mike Roll's team, to uh, see if there are, if there's equipment or materials that can help do some of those basic repairs uh, in a better way. And then, again, across the board, the mayor's really increased the investment in Katie's team to go and just fix more sidewalks across the city of Boston, taking a more, a more of a network approach. And as we do that, to think about what the right design is uh, to make sure that we are allowing for trees to grow in a right. healthy way without heaving up the pavers, which, as you know, is not an easy challenge. Yep. Not an easy and then lastly, in this round, uh, the overtime, $2.3 um, You know, I've been there. I understand that you're, you're never going to say, yes, we do need more women, men and women. I, I know you're not going to say that. I think you do. Uh, but I'm concerned with the dispersion ratio of, uh, of the overtime. Um, there are some staffers that are making over their base pay in overtime. And I think that you have uh, men and women who are making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars who are struggling to live in the city of Boston. Um, and I think that the overtime should be dispersed a little bit better. It concerns me greatly, and um, I think uh, it would also help with the morale of the people who are uh, struggling to stay in a very, very expensive city. And I know with the contract, the the newbies who are coming on at that lower rate need to live in the city of Boston. And the people who are kind of at that higher rate may not live in the city of Boston. And uh, the dispersion of the overtime uh, is concerning. So if we could keep a very close eye on that for the rest of the, the year and, and moving forward, um, that would be appreciated. So I'll wait for the next round. Thank you. Councilor Wu. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for what you do day to day and, and for a really smooth and great winter season. Um, I wanted to start just with a follow-up on Frontage Road. Um, I know, Chief, we had talked briefly about the study that was done, yeah. and you had mentioned at the time that it wasn't finalized yet, so just wondering if it is final and if it I could is, get a copy. It is almost done. Your is almost done. Okay. Um, my guess is, uh, I think before the, before the final passage of this budget, I think the util study will be complete. Uh, great. So thank you for patience on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, had just been following news out of Cambridge around their ordinance on um, coordinating when road resurfacing or roads are open up, um, complete streets, bike lanes, et cetera. That, that is already what we do generally here, right? Essentially, right, they, they focus on reconstruction and when we are reconstructing streets, a summer street, a com -Ave, we are, and it's part of the strategic bike network, we're adding those uh, bike facilities into it. Okay, um, and can you just share a little bit about how the, kind of between Public Works and BTD, how the actual process of coordinating within the org chart happens around those types of discussions? Sure, uh, so in general, and this is sort of in general, a uh, sort of the design and community process has really led uh, initial design and conceptual uh, sort, of, uh, sort of outcomes are really determined or driven through the BTD process. So essentially from initial community engagement until about a 25% design, so when the concepts are, are sort of uh, really sketched out from 25% to 100%. So when you go from concepts to really specific engineering drawings, that work is led by PARA's team. Um, once that project goes out to bid, it's led by Katie's team, and Katie's team will actually oversee the, uh, the reconstruction of, uh, of the road itself. And then once that ribbon is cut, it is handed over uh, to Mike's team to actually be able to maintain going forward. And so the first chunk, the community engagement to 25%, yep. that is, is it within engineering and BTD or one yeah, of the new really roles? It's within or? the needs shop. So it's within planning with sort of consultation with engineering, but planning in many ways leads that community outreach and sort of the initial design, making sure that it's following some of the uh, sort of longer term goals that we're trying to accomplish. Okay. So for example, who's the general example of a point person? Like Pat Hoey okay. would be a... Okay, uh, perfect. Got it. Okay. Um, and then... Just a, a quick word on uh, Long Island Bridge has come up a couple times. So yep. um, funding for the bridge construction or reconstruction, is that changed in terms of where it will come from and how much will come from the city? Uh, it is still 100% funded uh, by the city. Um, and I can double check the breakdown between uh, parking meter fund and general obligation bonds or, or PAR and Ken. Um, uh, we have 
thanks to PARS, uh, good work. Uh, we basically submitted by the end of last calendar year all the major permits. Uh, we expect to be at a sort of 100 percent design uh, by August of this year. And obviously, we are working through the public permitting process with Long Island Bridge right now. Okay. And this might be more for the BTD hearing, but um, would it be possible to get a breakdown of what has been spent out of the parking meter fund? Just, I don't know, say like yep. the last however many years is convenient. Yep. Um, it be, it would, it would be my dream if I could get that before BTD, so we could talk about it in detail there. Um, I would really appreciate that. And then just finally, um, for my round, mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about the contracts that have gone out. Um, I know there was a there. I had heard something about uh, incorporating stricter living wage standards in the recycling contract. Is, yes. Has that happened? Is it is it yep. feasible for the city with, with how that bid has come back? Uh, we made it a. Uh, we stated explicitly that we wanted a contractor to follow the living wage provisions. Um, that is, uh, we got uh, uh, basically only one respondent to uh, uh, to the IFB, uh, and we are working through with them now how they will be able to follow uh, uh, that requirement. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, oh, you know what? Before I recognize the next uh, question. <laughs> Could you just explain the report on front Frontage Road, what we had studied yeah. for that report? Yep. Um, so the, the util study that Council Wu referenced largely looked at what is uh, happening at Frontage Road today, and that's both 400 Frontage Road, which is where Public Works is, 300, which is sort of an administrative uh, facility of BTD, and 200 Frontage Road, which is the, the tow lot, and also looked at our street lighting facility and the place where signs and signals are maintained in the city of Boston, which is 12 Channel Street. Uh, in the Marine Industrial Park. They looked at those facilities, uh, did a review of uh, how many folks are there, what sort of, uh, what's the condition of the facility uh, that they're working in, uh, and then looked at um, are there feasible alternative locations uh, for those activities to happen, um, given some of the best practices that are happening in, others, in other municipalities. Um, what could some of those feasible locations look like? Uh, what would the cost of those be? Uh, and what would some of the impact of that be? And so that's the uh, report that UTL is wrapping up, and we should have uh, for you all shortly. Great. Thank you. Councillor Asabi George. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Councillor Wu's question regarding Long Island Bridge, what are the hearings that are outstanding? Yeah. Uh, the, per yeah. the permanent process. Uh, so, and Par can uh, talk more about this, but there are uh, essentially three local permits um, uh, a state wetlands permit from the Quincy Conservation Commission, a state wetlands permit from the Boston Conservation Commission, and a local wetlands permit from the Quincy Conservation Commission. Um, just to touch on those three before talking about state and federal, uh, we are uh, seeking and we expect to receive very shortly um, word back from state DEP for what's called a superseding order of conditions on the state wetlands uh, permits. The local wetlands permit um, from the Quincy Conservation Commission is currently in court. Uh, and we expect those court proceedings to happen uh, later over the course of this summer, uh, potentially early fall. I can give you the exact sort of timeline on that. On the state side, uh, we received a, a MEPA certificate uh, late last year, um, and that was then challenged, uh, and so that is also in court. It was challenged by Quincy. That is also in court. Um, and then tomorrow night is uh, our Chapter 91 hearing uh, in Quincy, so we'll be headed down to Quincy. Um, to uh, present on the means and methods of construction of the Long Island Bridge uh, and to give folks an update about the plan for Long Island itself. Uh, and that is the principal, that is the other major state permit uh, or license that we're seeking. The final permit is one which would come from the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, and that one will move forward once essentially the state and local um, permits have been, uh, have been granted. Great. Can you just tell us who oversees the Chapter 91 hearing? Just this is really for the information for our watch viewers at home. Yeah, as for as DEP. DEP. Yep. Great. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then um, a follow-up question um, from Councillor McCarthy regarding the crosswalks. How many raised crosswalks do we have in the city? I'm a big fan of those, especially in front of our schools, playgrounds, and. Uh, places where our elder buildings, our senior buildings across Great. our city. I, I doubt we have a specific number. Katie, do you have a... I, I don't know what the number is. Um, we've certainly increased the number that we're putting in, but I, I don't have a number. Yeah, it would be great at, at yeah. some point um, offline if you could share that. Mm -hmm. 
and um, any sort of plans to put in additional crosswalks, especially in places where little kids are. We lift them off the ground. If they're in front of our elementary schools and our playgrounds, some of our seniors, our older residents, especially in, in front of senior housing, we lift them because we know as we age, we sometimes shrink, but we also may be using a, the aid of a walker or a wheelchair. We are also uh, very, very supportive of that, looking to put it in more places, including in uh, Beacon Hill following the conversations that, that we have had. Um, they often do come with other engineering challenges due to drainage, which is often why it's more complex for KDC. Great, thank you. And then some of the other conversations we've had offline um, have been about some of the traffic implications due to what we're doing on the street. And I think about the Waze app yep. and how that impacts the flow of traffic through many of our communities and through our neighborhood streets. Talk a little, just if you give a little bit of education around what happens when a stop sign goes up and how that impacts the app. Uh, and then maybe some of the trends that we've seen uh, with traffic flow because of the apps, sure. or I mean, due I'm, largely in part to the apps. I'm sure there's not a community meeting that either one of us is at where somebody does not ask for some some adjustment to ways um, mm -hmm. that is happening. We have limited ability to um, uh, to influence the, the routing that Ways chooses uh, directly by working with Ways. So really, our focus is: are there ways we can achieve through engineering changes some of the traffic calming that that residents are seeking, um, and whether that is. The addition of, so of stop signs, the addition of, of speed humps, the raising of crosswalks, uh, the redirection of streets, any of those things are some of the things that we have in our toolkit um, that can really address some of the concerns that residents are seeing. Um, obviously, there's, I think, some opportunity for us to work with ways to see if we can also find ways to encourage them to guide people towards main arterials and not to residential side streets for, uh, for typical commutes. Are we seeing a direct cost associated with the increased volume on our neighborhood streets um, to the wear and tear of our roads? That is interesting. I wonder if through the, yeah. So I don't think that um, the apps have been around long enough for us to know whether we're actually seeing a, a sort of increased deterioration because of increased usage, um, but it is something that we'll be tracking. Yeah. Okay. That'll be interesting, just especially since we're in a budget hearing, to understand long term the impacts of uh, different volumes Absolutely. on our neighborhood streets. And then um, I think this was maybe, a f this is follow up maybe to Councillor Baker's question around some of the work around mass and cast, especially on the green areas. Yep. I understand that's a focus and where we're investing some uh, money. Are we training uh, public works staff on, this might be a question better for Mike, um, are we training public works staff on proper needle um, and sharps disposal and handling and disposal? Sure. At um, to date, we have not been trained. Um, we follow the, the um, guidelines from the shops teams. The, the added shops team last year has been very helpful. Um, we're there twice a day, um, morning and overnight, and in conjunction with um, Deputy Stratton from the police and also the shops team, we're able to handle the material. When we highlight them, see them, we create a 311 case, we notify the shops team, who's actually, they're there as much as we are. Um, mm -hmm. But as of now, no, we've not been trained. So what does happen when your crew is out and they come across impro improperly discarded sure. shops? So, um, so if Danny needs on site, there'll be a phone call made. Um, he's the um, assistant superintendent overseeing that area. If he's not on site, there's a uh, 311 case created. Um, and there's also been relationships built between the uh, Boston Public Health and our, and our um, district guards that handle that area. So I think we've seen the turnaround time go from a couple of years ago being, you know, a bulk of a day to being down to about an hour and a half. So um, they'll put them around. They'll they, they, sadly they won't find one. They'll find right. you know a handful, um, and they will push them, push them into an area, note them when the shop teams comes through. They'll point them to where the different locations are. What about training your staff for proper disposal? As of right now, we haven't been trained. Though. Is there a plan to train your staff? In Boston Public Schools custodians yeah, have yeah, been trained. Yeah. Teachers are disposing of sharps. Um, I've disposed of sharps. Yeah. When, when are we going to get to that point? It, it just is unfortunately our reality is, yeah. as a so, city. So with our workforce, um, there's no timetable yet to be trained. We've not talked to Boston Public Health about that. Um, I have had some um, calls from the union recently just about their concerns about handling sharps. Um, so um, when that day does come, it has to also go through that process that these guys feel safe and comfortable. We do have... Um, seasonal Hokies down in that area, who we who we keep away from the shops areas. These are folks who don't have any health insurance benefits. Um, so uh, when that day does come, it, it, it's yet to be scheduled. Um, it has to go through also just a, just a larger conversation. Right. Okay. I mean, I hope I hope we get there soon. I, I know Parks Department's been, I think, almost 100% trained 
Um, so I do, I think that this is a concern that the workforce should have and yeah. we want them properly trained, yeah. but we do need to get, we do need to get to that point. Thank you, that's it for me, I'm over time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, and we've been joined by Councillor Matt O'Malley. Councilor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Siomo, and uh, thank you guys uh, for all that you're doing for um, the city of Boston, as well as the folks behind me as well, the men and women who serve, and those who couldn't be here because they're at work. Um, appreciate all of you, and I got some, you know, some really great folks in my district. Mike, you know, just want to thank you on the record for your responsiveness. It's doesn't matter what day, what time. Sometimes it's really early, really late. Um, you, you just get back to us really quickly along with, of course, the folks that serve with you. So just want to um, thank this department for being one of the very responsive departments. Really appreciate it. Um, I also, I mean, I just have to acknowledge, I was sitting here thinking about Mr. Allen, of course, um, mm. my neighbor, um, obviously a public works guy who tragically uh, was, was killed, lived around the corner from me, but um, did a lot of great work in the community. And I just had to sort of note that sitting here, um, was thinking about him and the work that he did for the city of Boston as Thank well. Um, so just some, some follow-up questions. Uh, with respect to Long Island, um, I'm assuming Quincy is still fighting us on this. And again, we can't move forward unless Quincy gets on board uh, to make this bridge happen. Uh, we can move forward without the permits, and Quincy is still appealing uh, many of the, or, uh, yes, appealing okay. many of the permits that are going, our permit processes. Well, I appreciate, you, you know, your steadfast and, and persistence to, to move this along. It's really important to the community for obvious reasons. Um, on the, uh, going back to some questions from Councillor Baker on the yard waste, um, really exciting to see more um, opportunities to pick for pickup. That's uh, something that comes up quite a bit from folks in the community. Um, and also this idea of uh, dropping off. So how many locations will folks be able to drop off? When does that happen? Uh, so we're still working through the schedule, but it would be one location, which is the American Legion, the site on American Legion. The, is that the one in my district? Exactly. Is that city yep. soil? Exactly right. Okay, got it. Yep. Welcome to D4. This is great. <laughs> um, and then Speaking of the, this idea of city soil being able to sell, I know that was a conversation for quite some time. Is that actually happening now? Do they have that ability? Will they have that ability? And when does that actually happen? So there are now, and there are now some locations on that site where they are selling various materials. I don't know how active their sales are, but that is that was something which they were given the right to do. We were much more explicit in this RFP uh, that the contractor would have the right to be able to sell, and we asked for uh, them to uh, give us essentially uh, an understanding of how they would give discounts to residents, making sure that some of these things which are collected from residents' yards actually then were uh, affordable for residents to be able to purchase uh, for their own home gardening. So are they, are they selling now or that sort of to come based mm -hmm. on the new RFP? They had set up to sell. I don't know if they are actively selling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. No, that's great. And I appreciated Councillor Baker's questions as well. Um, uh, just um, going back to, we've been hearing quite a bit now that we have, we still have sort of a vacant position in public works. We got a new commissioner who's obviously interim, but at some point hopefully that won't remain interim. Folks are talking about how we align the departments, you know, um, was talking to Katie at, at some length about Blue Hill Lab and, and the possibilities from the public works perspective on Blue Hill Lab. Um, but then of course you meet with BTD and some of the other departments and they have their own thoughts and ideas. Yeah. So how does coordination currently work? From your perspective, how could we be um, aligning a little bit better? Sure. Um, there are moments, um, and I'll be frank, there are points of frustration if Public Works is going out to do some really incredible work that we want in the district, but BTD might have their own plans or some other department might be separate and apart. How do we align and then how can we uh, do that better just to, in terms of efficiencies, of course, saving money and making sure we're all on the same page? Sure. So that particular question around uh, sort of alignment on design and construction is actually a big focus of the person who's right behind you, Dan Lesser, who's been mm -hmm. spending uh, the last couple of months really working with um, the engineering teams, construction management teams, folks like Amy Cording from the PIC, um, and the Boston Transportation Department team to figure out how do we create a more, uh, a, a better process, both of engagement oh up gosh. front and then sort of uh, management throughout an entire construction process so that mm -hmm. those initial uh, intents are held to and that we have clear communications uh, inside uh, the two departments and that we're able to uh, then have sort of better products and, that are being delivered and more quickly uh, in the neighborhoods. Um, that is a big chunk of the work that we've got going on right now and our expectation is that over the course of this coming year 
uh, we're going to put into place those new practices to make our processes simply that much better. Um, no, this is great to hear and, and, you know, of course, let us know how we could be helpful in, in informing the conversation based on what we hear. Um, you know, each department is really, you know, trying to do really incredible work. Great. A lot of folks who are overworked and underpaid for the, you know, who work for the city of Boston. So we want to make sure that whatever my response is, it's, it's not to, to sort of just be critical. Yeah, totally. It's just to tell you what we're hearing and mm -hmm. hopefully to deliver better service for, for the residents. Um, Quick question on um, the Hokies. I mean, there was an investment last year that was, everyone sort of said, yes, this is a good thing, particularly around our business districts and Main Street areas. How did that work out? Um, and um, is there anything in this budget that expands that? Is that enough folks on the ground doing the work? And then I can save my other questions for the next one. Sure. So um, we, we hired the six full-time Hokies oh. in that contract. Um, I'm sorry, in that, in that budget. budget um, yeah. We did see, I, I, I had mentioned um, five have already been promoted. Um, and so yeah. we've just hired in four more to fill. We've got a fifth being hired in as well. So it's, it's been a huge success. Areas that didn't have a full-time Hokie now have full-time Hokies. Um, they're supplemented, of course, by our seasonal work, where we, where we get the uh, 10 bodies in the uh, early spring, 10 more in the summer. And we've actually been very lucky to get 10 more in the fall. So um, those, six, those six folks do great work. It's probably the most important position in public works from where I sit. Um, and to see them already moving up that ladder and in the backfill has been awesome inside of a calendar year. Um, so it's kind of how it's supposed to work. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank Samuel. you. And we've been round. joined by Councilor Lydia Edwards. Uh, let me recognize Councilor Matt O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, early afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for my tardiness. I had a, a wonderful event at Millennium Park with the mayor and with Chief Cook at the unveiling of the first uh, sun safety station from our friends at Impact Melanoma, a great uh, initiative that this body led on and that we're now seeing in states around the country. So nothing to do with DPW other than uh, hopefully some of your workers will take advantage because it's also practicing sun safety week in Boston. Um, I, I'm sure you, you touched upon this, Chief, but um, for my own edification, if you wouldn't mind just sort of repeating, I have a lot of concerns. We've talked offline and, you know, privately, publicly about sort of the changes to the recycling co uh, contract, what the cost is going to be. I know we haven't yet finalized a contract, but can you sort of give me the Reader's Digest version of where we are and what the numbers look like? Uh, so across the board, all the trash and uh, recycling and composting contracts are going up. Um, that means uh, we will be spending more on collections, more on trash disposal, more on recycling processing, and more on uh, yard waste composting. within. Uh, recycling in particular, uh, while we don't have a final number uh, uh, in terms of what the, what the likely cost would be, um, we are seeing that change really driven by two things. One, higher processing costs and due to high contamination rates. Yep. So an impetus for us to, um, as Councilor Flaherty was saying, to do more to actually lower the contamination rate, lower the amount of trash that's in the recycling. Uh, and then second, there is a role that I think we all need to play in, uh, in supporting uh, sort of a broader purchase of recycled uh, materials uh, because that will then uh, sort of increase revenue uh, back to the city and lower the overall cost as well as just reduce the amount of sort of emissions and natural resources consumption. Okay. And is it uh, Casella is still the only vendor who's uh, We had one response that was Casella. And when will the decision be made? Uh, certainly before June 30th. Um, obviously, we'd like to like to have that wrapped up fairly fairly okay. shortly. Okay, and other than public education, which is important, what are some other initiatives that we're looking to sort of educate uh, citizens on how to so correctly use single stream recycling? So DEP has a whole recycling IQ toolkit, uh, yeah. which the team has been exploring, uh, figuring out what's the right mix of broad education, sort of targeted outreach, and then even. Uh, potential sort of like flyering on specific uh, recycling bins, yeah. uh, which we've been exploring to figure out what the right way is to better educate constituents about what can be recycled and what really is trash. Might it be time to go back to dual stream recycling? I think the I think we'd want to start with education. Uh, yeah. It would be a seismic change. Clearly, you see lower contamination rates in places that don't have single stream. That is certainly true. Um, but we did see an overall increase in our recycling, our diversion rate by going to single stream. Um, I'd rather see if we can get uh, help residents uh, together sort of recycle right before going back into a stream. Okay. And then I've been asking now for, for predating 
everyone in this pit. Well, I think Anne's been around longer than most, but uh, she started here when she was 16 years old. That's why she's been, been here, so, so that's why. But um, I've been wanting to see a piloted curbside composting pickup in this city for quite some time. I get that there is an upfront cost. I'll happily stipulate that fact. But studies have shown that we could divert a quarter of our trash if we were to have curbside composting. I know there's been some efforts, and I applaud you. Chief, I think DPW is one of the best run departments in the city of Boston. I mean that sincerely. So I appreciate what has happened as it relates to Project Oscar, but we're not capturing enough people. We're preaching to the choir. The people who use Project Oscar are people who are going to compost anyway. How do we grow that percent? I guess what is the status of looking at a piloted program? Yep. Uh, so uh, I think that having a full curbside composting pilot is, or a full curbside composting program far targeted at uh, food waste is uh, a step that we cannot yet take uh, that is sort of beyond where we might actually be. That said, I think as we have, as we have discussed, um, and you can get into the details of that, I think the, the hearing which you're going to host, I think there's an opportunity to think about how we pilot curbside collection for composting over the course of this upcoming fiscal year in a way which is uh, at limited cost to the city of Boston and helps us begin to understand is there a way we can do food waste collection different from the way which we're currently doing with Project Oscar? So I think we'll have some oh, yes. good opportunity to collaborate. Talk a little bit more about that, because that that's actually sounds yeah. positive to it me. Does. So we're still kind of working out what the details of this might look like, but there yeah. are obviously people who in this city are providing curbside collection right now. In other cities in the United States, there's ways in which they are uh, sort of rolling out similar services, more of a subscription-based service uh, than one where the city is necessarily providing the entire service to every single household in the city. So we think there's some initial piloting steps that we might be able to take. We're still sort of working this out, so give us a little time. We're okay. going to get back to you on that. Do you, but I assume you foresee this as a free service. Uh, we're looking at sort of the right way to do this. Again, we're very mindful of the cost that we are bringing to sure. you of recycling, of trash collection, of composting in general. Do you know offhand what the, what, if, what the tonnage cost would be for curbside pickup? Uh, I don't, we can get that from Cambridge. I'm sure there's some folks that like me know. I don't know that, okay. Um, but sadly, I bet it's not that dissimilar from now what we're looking at at a recycling rate. I, I guess we've, the reason why momentum's on our, time, on our side here okay. is that the value of recycling has plummeted from where right. I started in this position. We were generating revenue for every tonnage of recycling, and now we're paying more than we are for trash. So I think any way we can do to, do, I, I value, you and I have said this, I know the mayor feels that way, we are committed to recycling, some other cities are not, we are in Boston and that is an ironclad guarantee, so how do we then minimize the extra cost? And I think that the, uh, I look forward to further conversations, but I will be pushing that, uh, that's one of my biggest uh, initiatives this budget cycle. Um, how much should we spend on, is my time up yet, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Half a minute. Okay, just briefly, and then I'll wait for the next round. What was our um, uh, snow removal budget, and what did we spend? 20, uh, we don't know what the final number of the budget was. $24 million. We're slotted for 24.8 in this coming fiscal year. Oh, so we hit it, which is... Uh, we're still doing the final tally of across all departments. It's not just us, and there's still some sort of winter snow expenditures, like okay. fleet replacements, salt shed improvements that we're still making. Okay, but just for those watching, typically we go way over our budget, so yeah, it would, we're, it we're would seem to me that we're not going to go way over. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. Councilor Edwards. Thank you very much. I, uh, I just want to kick off my remarks with just acknowledging some incredible folks in your team that have done really a great job by our communities. I wanted to thank Billy and Lenny, who are Hoc uh, Hokies in East Boston and um, the North End. I wanted to thank Ty Jackson, who works over in uh, the DPW over in East Boston, um, Joe Blazo, Nick uh, Mustachio, and uh, Mike Summers all have been wonderful and responsive. Also, just uh, directly to the folks who are here, or oh, Eric, is Eric here? Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, we've been able to meet with them. They came personally out. Eric and Katie personally came out to the North End to walk the sidewalks where we could show them areas uh, for improvement, and we hope that they'll be on this. Some of them will be on this uh, summer schedule for improvement. And uh, also to you, Michael, uh, you were, I got a direct call after that. Um, I called you at, I think, 445 about snow removal in Charlestown, and the, 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 the bus or the truck was out there um, that moment, and it was in, we got a call the next day saying thank you. So um, the responsiveness of your team, willing, willing to come out there, literally take the hands-on experience uh, with me while uh, it's been wonderful, so thank you so much. Um, 
Also, just your responsiveness and meeting with us directly about bridges, for example. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm going to kick off my uh, updates. And <laughs> you're smiling because uh, we all want to know what's going on with uh, several bridges. And I'll start with, you know, this round with really talking about updates on um, some capital things. So the Alfred Street Bridge, um, uh, the, of course, the North Washington Street Bridge, um, the McArdle Bridge, and um, just just wondering what's going on in terms of those updates. So I'll start at a high level in park and jump in. Alfred Thank Street you. Bridge is substantively complete. Um, so the deck replacement has been done in mm -hmm. coordination with, with MassDOT. Um, North Washington Street Bridge is underway. The next big milestone will be the creation of the, the temporary bridge, uh, which will allow us to maintain uh, sort of a consistent pattern of two lanes inbound and one lane outbound for the duration of the construction pro uh, process. Our expectation is that temporary bridge is in place by the end of this calendar year. By what? By the end of this calendar year. Oh, to have a temporary bridge yeah, up. The temporary bridge will be up. For the pit. The, for the pit is fixed. Yes, the temporary piece. Yes. Um, the, uh, and then McArdle, you can speak to better than I can. McArdle still needs lots of attention. It is one of our older bridges. And uh, we will continue to give it the attention it yeah. needs, but it needs attention. Yes. So uh, how are we going to... Um, Tell me about the, some attention needs that it has and <laughs> the ability to so, get them done. Uh, it's not one of our young bridges. It, it's, it's one of our older bridges. The sidewalks are in need of attention. The bridge deck is in need of attention. Uh, Councillor, the biggest challenge we have is this bridge goes between Boston and one of our sister cities. Right. And I always wonder why is it that we are carrying that full burden of maintaining that bridge. Uh, we had a similar bridge, the Chelsea Street Bridge, we managed to give that to Mass DOT. It mm -hmm. was also one of our intercity bridges. So we will continue to uh, uh, keep this bridge in a state of good repair or aspire to that uh, as much as we keep an eye towards um, having a shared responsibility of uh, maintaining this bridge. Mm -hmm. No, I, and I understand, uh, at least with the two Chelsea Chelsea East Boston bridges exactly. that yes. we're dealing with Coast Guard, the yes. state, yes. and Chelsea, yes. along with the city of Boston, yes. and trying to coordinate all of those. Even we were trying to get the schedule for the bridge uh, to be more convenient because you know when that bridge goes up, yes. uh, all new infrastructure, including the extension of the Silver Line, is basically useless uh, because the bridge is up. And that, that coordination, unless we figure out a way to, to talk to it, I think it was the two bridges trying to talk to each other was the last time. And the time. signals associated with them. Uh, so the, when the Chelsea Street Bridge was built, Councillor, we, because it was a city-owned bridge, at least when we built that, we put enough intelligence so that it can talk to the other <coughs> So as uh, you have noted, the traffic signals on the city of Chelsea side and the Boston side and these two bridges need to be coordinated for the communications. And I believe there's an effort underway uh, sponsored by Mass Department of Transportation to sort of bring all these elements together. So it is four entities, the city of Boston, city of Chelsea, Mass DOT, and the Coast Guard. To at least have the lights coordinated. Yeah, so Mass is working on that effort right now, and we can get you an update on um, that their process. Okay. Um, well, in the time I have left, just switching from bridges to um, some of the... Um, Supplementing some of the services uh, in in East Boston, Lenny does an incredible job. He is out every day, and I'm just wondering if there's a way. I think he's our dedicated Hokey in East Boston, and we might get some temporary ones. But is there any way to get another one um, for East Boston? It's so much. Sure. So your so your seasonal Hokey actually just starts, I think, a week from today. Okay. Um, so he'll be there for five months. Okay. Um, the the idea that we can get a dedicated Hokie to Easty beyond Lenny would be terrific. Um, you've got multiple squares. You've got, you know, um, East Eagle Hill. I mean, you've got, you've got some spots that are just tough to be one Hokie in one area. I, I right. think the Salem Street Hokie in the North End Hokie is able, is able to kind of handle that area. Right. Um, so we are looking at how we can use these six permanent Hokies that we added on to, to maybe move someone um, in and around, at least seasonally. It would be a permanent Hokie, but it would be... Um, potentially adding just some more support to um, Lenny and whoever the seasonal piece is. But I, I agree. It's a, it's, 
it's not a condensed neighborhood. It might be an island, but it, but it's not. Right. You've seen Lenny. Lenny does great work where he's at. It's it's it's, it's tough to get Lenny over to Day Square right. and then back over to Maverick. So um, we are we are going through that conversation. But you will have that seasonal hokey, which is five months starting in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to go over some of the employee figures, and I think it bears repeating. Uh, the investment or the recommended appropriation, especially for capital, has gone from like 70 million, I believe, to like 105 million uh, um, recommended for FY20, which uh, includes a lot of work that power has to do, I guess. But uh, so I just wanted to look, and is it my understanding that you are? Uh, transferring animal control out of public works? Yes, I mean, that's not, no. that not with us before. Oh, it's, it, that's been for a while. It's, yeah. been, it's in parks now, yeah. right, correct, okay. So could you, um, I'm looking at kind of lower, right, employee figures, and I think I had somewhere at one point it was 388, and according to the information, looks like we have about 357. So we were looking, correct me if I'm wrong, Ann, um, we had in our FY19, 381, we are uh, expecting for FY20 to actually be able to add to that, and that, that does include um, uh, some construction managers that would work with Katie, uh, and some additional support uh, for PARA, um, and then uh, a team, or some additional investment in personnel uh, for Mike to make sure that we're actually maintaining a lot of the stuff that we're building. Um, so there is a path to be able to actually expand our, our headcount. Okay. Um, right now, uh, without those additional investments, though, we would be looking at 381. 381, uh, okay. Uh, as our headcount within public works. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wanted to switch over to um, page 250, just for clarification, page 250 in the budget book. Um, let me grab it. I think it's litter baskets. And personnel hours, right, for litter baskets under the performance. Um, the actual for this, or for FY18, was um, almost 1,600. And then the projected for 19 and 20 is 6,200. So um, can you account for that big spike in that performance, I guess? And do you know why that, came, why that popped up? Well, I, I'm not really sure. I'm going to have to kind of look into it. I think part of it has to do with we weren't really count, we hadn't been counting the hours on the litter baskets until mid mid year, gotcha. and now um, it, and that's when it became part of a projection. Uh, and right. so we're only looking at part of them, um, and mm -hmm. we're, we're looking to increase and in, right. you know show it more um, okay. now. So it's really na unfortunately it's an apples to oranges. It's not really a full year. Gotcha. And some of the litter baskets are the old, you know, one not contained, Correct. Correct. and then this contained. So is does one give us information when they're full still? And no. All? So we, we have 1,700 total litter baskets throughout the city. They can be anywhere from what we call the um, big bellies that you know, the dual yeah. stations or the single stations, um, the regular Victor Stanley, if you will, which is the fluted stainless steel black mm -hmm. um, that have the domes on them. Um, then we still have some of those still those 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 cages that you see that the um, MBTA had put out that I think I'd say about 10 years ago um, highway assumed um, collection of over the T. Um, mm -hmm. So those that's kind of a hodgepodge okay. um, across the city. Nothing right now um, is speaking to us. We found that when we tried it and it told us not to pick it up on Hanover Street because it wasn't full, you still have to go buy it because someone put a trash bag next to it. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't go to a big belly because it didn't tell us to, in this city, we'd be leaving mini transfer stations around the city. Right. Um, right. So right. the cost of, for that data, um, mm -hmm. in conjunction with the fact that just operationally, we're not a campus. We're we're, we're a moving city yeah, with right. people who drive in from Everett sometimes to drop a bag and everything else. So we so we just found that litter basket routes are far more efficient. Um, right. It is I, I call it a hodgepodge. It is a mix of everything that we have out there, um, but uh, in total, it's seventeen hundred. I would say there's probably 700 big bellies. Um, the number's probably around 700 of the uh, Victor Stanleys, okay. and then you get that rest 300, 400 of those MBTA right. cages. Gotcha. Okay. And I know that the ones that aren't contained can, can present problems. In a, yeah. Right. And they're smaller. Um, right. Trash can blow out of them. Yeah. So 
We're trying to do our best we can to replace them. Okay. And then um, page 252 under street lights, um, again, I think it's FY17, uh, 5519, and it average 58 days. Then FY18, I believe, 3732, average 34 days. Mm -hmm. And then we're projected to do um, 5,400 and we're bringing down the average days to 10. And let me say that some, some streetlights get switched out like that, and some of them take a long time. Is there any reason for that, or? So on the, Mike can speak more to this, but uh, what you're seeing with 10 days, 10 is our service level agreement for fixing a streetlight. That is our, our intent is to be able to fix essentially 80% of all the outages that come in, like a report to us from 311 within 10 business days, which is what you see there. The reason you're seeing that number decline is because of some very good work uh, by Mike, by John Yetman, by Mike Donaghy to really in, to look at what the backlog was within street lighting and very intentionally sort of manage uh, our efforts to drive down that outstanding backlog and just be more, uh, get closer and closer to that 10 business day uh, number. Right. So fair. Yeah. Um, and you feel confident, Mike, that that's doable because it's a big discrepancy from yeah, I mean, it's a goal. Practices. Um, but yes, uh, you start getting issues with um, underground conduit. You've got a lot of different things that could, you know, a street light out might be six right. different things it rather than one. Might be a bulb or yeah, a bigger project. It could be a project. utility. It could right. be it could be a handful of things. So, right. um, and that can always throw, you know, a case. One case goes to 100 days, and now you've completely skewed the numbers. Right. Great. Okay, uh, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Siomo. Um, Andrew Square Civic Association, uh, myself and Councillor Baker uh, represent that area. Um, during the winter time, when there's snow or there's, um, there's flooding, a lot of the handicap ramps are frozen solid. I don't know if it was the way it was constructed or not, but certainly it's a um, public safety issue, but also um, access for the disabled and elderly. Is that something we could take a look at as well? There's ponding that's happening at the yeah. rooms. Okay. We'll take a look at that. Okay. Um, also, that area, um, you know, we, we would love to see a year-round hokey there. Um, myself and Councilor Baker meet frequently with the Andrew Square Civic Association. That's one of their requests that they've made is um, because of how close it is to Albany Street, Mass Ave, Southampton Street, it's the closest. MBTA station. Um, we have a lot of foot traffic heading in that direction. We also have a lot of um, uh, litter as well. So uh, I'd love to see a year round hokey there. So I'd speak to just to, just yep. to that point. Danny Nee has actually started a um, hokey in that area for the past probably three months. He starts his day there. Um, that's where that's where that hokey will start. It's on. It's not the whole day because they just get the West Broadway, East Broadway. Um, but we have in the past two to three months. Um, put put a presence there uh, Monday through Friday. Okay. Um, then all of, all over South Boston, I'm hearing uh, from residents if we could get more uh, trash bins, recycle. Um, is we have a lot of foot traffic on West Broadway, East Broadway, Dorchester Street, Preble Street, or Colony Avenue D Street. Just want to see if we can um, get more uh, barrels. Yep. Uh, that would be a priority. Um, I know we talked about Frontage Road. Um, that surrounds the, the neighborhoods in my district, South Boston, Chinatown, the Leather District, the South End. Yeah. I really want to make sure that, you know, I'm almost one of the first people um, you call when there's an issue on Frontage Road. Uh, that's critical to me. That's my, that's the heart of my neighborhood, so I need to be involved in, um, in every aspect of that, of that plan. Um, is that something you'd, you'll commit to? Yes. Stray voltage, I know you talked about that, Chief, and I appreciate the, the work your department is doing on that. That's been an issue um, not only in my district, um, but across the street, across the city. What's the latest, or what, what is your, your office planning to do? So there's, a, there's funding proposed here of $650,000, which would allow us to do a comprehensive assessment of uh, our street lighting cabinets. And, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
Uh, there's $650,000 in uh, this proposed budget, which would allow our street lighting division to do a comprehensive assessment uh, and plan for uh, reducing incidents of, incidents of stray voltage uh, in the city of Boston. Uh, so if funded, that would allow us to actually uh, really figure out the right way to systematically work through any issues that are that are causing stray voltage. That's on top of the work which the street lighting team is just regularly doing and their coordination with Eversource uh, to address any issues that are identified and respond to those in a, in a quick manner. Thank you, Chief. And um, Summer Street, I know phase one is going very well. Yep. The second phase would basically go from Summer Street more towards the South Boston, you got to it. South Boston. Yeah, from basically from West Service Road uh, to the Reserve Channel, more or less. When will that take place? So there is, I believe, $1.5 million in, I believe it's in BTD's budget, um, to do the planning for that. Um, okay. But that would follow after uh, some of the current South Boston waterfront planning studies that are happening right now. Uh, so BTD would pick up that, uh, that effort and then uh, work with uh, the public works team here with Parr and Katie to uh, get that into the ground. Thank you, Chief. I know you have a stormwater pollution study for the south end. Can you give us a little background on that? Yeah, so the SWPP. Um, and you have, well, I can. I, I, I don't have the, okay. the, the study on it. All right, so uh, the, I'll get you the details on it, yeah. but essentially it is, I believe, related to the frontage road work. <clears throat> okay, and my final, my final question is, I was impressed with the public works and the great work they did with the neighborhood and the Bay Village on Saturday, able to move all the cars out. Um, they got cooperation for the business community and um, garages as well. But Chief, do you think we could maybe do a pilot, um, the same type of um, response in Chinatown this summer, maybe a weekend when it's not as many people there, maybe around the July 4th weekend, is asking residents of Chinatown to move their cars, work with the business community to try to identify some lots and really do a thorough job of cleaning the entire neighborhood um, I, I think we need it. Um, I think they need a lot of help. Composting would be a critical issue as well. Uh, public, public education awareness campaign. But could you work with me if I identified a sure. date in, in July yeah. and to, we can move all the cars in Chinatown and do a thorough cleaning of the entire neighborhood. Um, the public works people that are there do an excellent job, but I want us to do the best job we possibly can, and I think that takes moving the cars. We can see if there's a, a day that lines up with some of the existing street cleaning work we're already doing, when there might be fewer cars on the curb, and okay. whether it's on one day or over a series of days, we've got the right way to work with you on that. Yeah, if you look at Oxford Street in Chinatown, um, cars are on, one, on, on the right-hand side going up, but a, a, a clean, a practically can't even go up the side of the street. It's so narrow and dense, um, but just a lot of coordination and preparation, but I, I really want to see some type of pilot in, in Chinatown for the summer. All right. Yeah, we'll work it down there. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, you had mentioned uh, the trash collection, uh, the, uh, the new contract starts July 1st. That's correct. So have we selected a vendor? Has the city selected a vendor yet? Uh, we are going through the actual sort of nuts and bolts of the procurement. Uh, sort of contracting award process at this point. Right. Is it fair to say uh, we, we're going to have multiple vendors? I mean, it's a pretty big city. We've uh, done that in the past. We're, we're going by the rules of the award, which is the sort of the lowest responsive, responsible bidder, and that's uh, what we're following in this practice. Right. Um, we can, we'll give you an update as soon as it goes through the process on sort of the number of vendors and, and who the selected uh, uh, vendor or vendors are. Okay, and you had mentioned earlier in round one that uh, the trash collection was going to start early. It's going to start at 6 o'clock. W uh, what are the factors behind that? Sure. Could we, is, it, is it cost savings? Um, it's part of the contract, of course. Could we start even earlier if we recognize? So can you just kind of play that through? We have been getting, my office has been getting calls. I know Council Flynn has been getting calls as well from the south end, some folks wanting to do trash collection at night, yep. sort of like 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock yep. at night. I don't know if that makes sense yep. or not, but uh, it's worth the conversation. If we're going to recognize the cost savings, we're also going to get the trash off the streets, which will help us with rodent control. Um, for all of it, but um, could you give me a sense of what's, what's behind the sort of the 6 a.m. start and could exactly. we go even earlier? I mean, exactly what you said. We feel like we'll get trash off the curb sooner, uh, which will make a difference, too. They'll be able to get through all of their routes faster, uh, which will mean less congestion in, uh, in the p.m. Uh, rush hour, as well as just a general sort of quicker uh, response time. And we think because it's going to be a uh, 
it'll take less time to be able to do the overall work that likely is going to result in a lower cost to the city. Um, Mike may certainly have additional things right. to add to that. No, I think the most important thing is it, 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 it gets the trash crews off the streets. Uh, often we hear of that, you know, you go home and you're stuck behind a trash truck on your way home from work. Um, this will help them um, get going faster, get ahead of the traffic. Um, it actually is a, the um, genesis of it came from our highway division. We moved a five o'clock shift um, on all litter baskets and, we, and, and our efficiency skyrocketed. Um, the second part of that is now trash will sit in the streets a shorter time. Um, so, you know, trash put out, now put out in the evenings doesn't sit there um, mm -hmm. as long with this with this new plan. Right. I believe it's, we had a situation a few years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, was like say the Southwest corridor, like the West Roxbury, Rosendale, trucks when they got full, they had to go to like Chelsea maybe mm -hmm. or Winthrop to dump. Is that still happening? Yeah, so. Um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we figure that out? We need more sites locally. Um, but um, as of right now, we take our trash to Lynn, Saugus, and Braintree, depending on what part of the city they're in. Um, we take our public works trash locally to Roxbury, but they don't have the capacity to take. Um, when I say public works trash, I mean litter baskets, right. street sweeping. Um, but for right now, it's Braintree, Saugus, and Lynn. For the, is the, is so the whole hypothetically, just for our ratification, so if you have a full truck, say, in West Roxbury, and they then have to leave West Roxbury, go to, say, Lynn, dump the truck, and then go back to West Roxbury and finish the route. Sure, and now, and now sometimes they'll have a second truck that's empty. Okay. That will that will actually they'll take one driver will go up and dump and another guy in that truck jumps in the empty truck um, for efficiency's sake on there and so 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 not all the times so they have to turn those trucks will turn around but some of them will get a head start on those afternoon routes. Right. So no, there's no dumping site say out in the southwest corridor or not right now. One of those areas. No. That would be huge, I think, for us. So that's Massive. probably a big. That's probably one of the big factors <laughs> of driving the cost here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, how do we assess crosswalks in terms of do we have someone going out and? Sizing them up regularly is that more you? Is that more transportation? Uh, um, that so. is led out of the operations division of BTD, uh, and we can talk certainly more about that tomorrow. But they, right. uh, but that team uh, believes that we're actually seeing year over year improvement in the in the quality and condition right. of uh, uh, of the sidewalks, and actually working with Katie's team, uh, we are trying to find a new way over the course of this year to better track that as an asset right. so that we're. I know my office gets a lot of calls from crosswalks Absolutely. that are not clearly visible. I assume that that's a, a lot of calls to 311. But I also, uh, to, to Mike, um, there's only a certain part of the time of the year that we can actually lay the stripes, right? It's correct. Because it's temperature driven in terms of the road. Yeah, and that's correct. Any other new materials out there that we're looking at that we can, that allow us to do this year round or in the colder uh, weather? Not at this point. I mean, thermoplast is really sort of what we are been focused on. Right. It, right. Sorry, Councillor. the Whatever the material we use, it needs to have reflectivity so that during nighttime hours it reflects the headlights. Mm -hmm. So that sort of limits the polycarbon materials which we right. use, which is temperature different, right. driven. Yeah, so I know the public probably doesn't realize that because they call the office all the time just thinking we can just go out and stripe. But what, what, is the, what is the optimum temperature that we need the road to be to lay the stripe? Ambient temperature needs to be at, at least about 45 to 50 degrees. So it is basically during the spring, summer, Fall. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. if there's an emergency situation, counselor, we can always go and put paint. But that we are out in about three okay. to six months. Right. The age of our fleet and sort of what's the uh, the plan to replace uh, our vehicles and any thought given to sort of sharing vehicles with other municipalities. I know that there's some outfit out there that's talking about maybe equipment sharing or truck and vehicle sharing with municipalities that. To try to drive the cost down, not, not quite you sure. You can certainly pull, and you may know the average age of our fleet. I don't, uh, Matt Brown is here, but um, we are as new as we've ever been on average. Okay. Um, thanks to the good work by Matt and Bill, um, in across all of our lines, our, our snow, our spring, summer, our sweepers. Um, we've, we've, I feel to have the average. Matt, do you have it? Seven, Seven years. Um, Seven. So. You know, I think six years ago when we showed up here, it was we had we, would, yeah. we had trucks from '94, '95, '96, '97. So that team has done very well to maintain those, but also rotate us in um, newer, both sweepers, plows, um, pickups. So I'll say, I mean, so this administration has done a great job in turn, not just with public works, but all of our vehicles, our fire departments, etc. Yeah. Just make sure that we get updated trucks and vehicles and equipment has been huge. And then just lastly on the frontage road, I know that we, we're eagerly waiting, awaiting the report. Um, Chief, um, just sort of conceptually, if you're thinking about like where would the where would the salt and where would the tow lot, where would that go? Like sort of we have a facility that's kind of located sort of centrally within a bunch of different neighborhoods. If we were to, you know, if you were to, if that was to, to go out to bin and to be redeveloped and we had to find a location in the city uh, for the salt and for the tow lot, where, where do you envision that taking sure. place? 
So what the report will uh, sort of documents is not necessarily the preferable location, but feasible locations. Uh, it did actually include uh, keeping some of those things, particularly uh, salt at frontage road itself, um, just putting it sort of more towards the southern end. It also looked at some additional locations throughout the city, including uh, locations approximate to 1010 Mass Ave, as well as uh, uh, locations that were near uh, water and sewer. Um, again, this was sort of their initial cut of are there feasible locations for us to move to, uh, not necessarily right. the preferred locations. Right. And that I argue that our sand and salt is our best weapon uh, totally. in a snowstorm and would hate to have to be uh, looking for it uh, as opposed to looking yeah, at it. Yeah, you're not the only one. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Baker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I want to pick up where he left off. Why aren't I mean, it, my opinion that that's the, our best location for it. So I would suggest that as we're getting ready for RFPs or, or however that looks is, let's design what we need for our needs first because that, that parcel is, is for city operations first. So we should be designing, whether if we go vertical, vertical whatever we do, that, that would be my suggestion. That's what I would like to see because I know transportation Transportation is a good fit there. Public works is a good fit there. But we also have to keep in mind, will that study <clears throat> um, show us how bad that building is over there? Uh, so to the public works yeah, main so, facility. So to your, to your first question, um, a number of their recommended locations or feasible locations are frontage road itself. Okay. Just consolidation, and to your point, densification or, or building higher, essentially on the southern end of that parcel. Um, it did not do a cost analysis of the cost for repairing, particularly 400 frontage road. Um, we have. Well, I mean, I think it, we know we exactly. shouldn't be doing a, a cost analysis of repair of 400. Correct. So that's a good move. Right. So we we have in this budget some very minor investments, um, but critical investments in that building: uh, a sewer pipe, uh, the elevators, uh, the glass wall, the north mm -hmm. lobby, um, the HVAC system, which just are about. The, ensuring the next couple of years that that building uh, is working well, um, but we know that it's a much higher price tag uh, for a. And you said sewer pipe. Is it one sewer pipe? Is it multiple sewer pipes that are that are? It's one beneath the main, right? Yeah. It's a dual it's right one ring. So you need to replace the whole thing. Is that embedded in concrete in the in the in the first floor? Uh, it's it's, uh, it's very old, and it is just sorry, council. It is very old, direct buried, and it is. Uh, it needs to be changed. Is it below the concrete floor in, in or, or is it, it's not in concrete, no, is it? These are the sewer pipes that are feeding it. So once you leave the building, yeah. and when it gets into the major trunk lines, these are the sewer pipes that are underneath the public works yard. So it is in the dirt. Okay, okay, so, so, but also within the building, are they collapsing within the building also? The, the areas, the pipes that are underneath the building is in better shape than the pipes that are Okay, that, that was my question right there, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and Chris, you and I talk about this, I think every time I'm in front of you, yep. um, we talk about what's going to happen in the future, recycling all this, yep. you know, it, it's just going to get more and more, and, and I would suggest, I would love to see us actually talking about looking at the, the possibility of, a, of our own digester keeping all that in-house. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about driving from West Roxbury to Lynn for our waste. This is the future here. So why wouldn't we look at building our own digesters, staffing it with our own people, public works or whoever it is? Um, do you want to an answer to that or you want to just, we'll leave that out there? So, so really quickly, um, we've had a number of conversations looking at different ways we can address exactly this and uh, we'll likely issue an RFI to understand what are those sort of options that we might be able to explore as a city and what does that relationship, ownership, management, all those sort of things look like in those sorts of situations. Specifically for a digester? For both uh, sort of food waste, for other sort of, uh, for any of those sort of materials, just looking, I think this contracting process has made us uh, really come to grips with the fact that these costs are escalating. Mm -hmm. and there may be some things the city uh, can do to actually just better stabilize those costs going forward if we had a higher degree of ownership or site selection. Yeah. and and and. Manhattan does a daily drop off at their train stations the plastic the plastic bags that compost yep. daily um, so we should be looking at things like that uh, Chris can you talk about or whoever talk about your online <clears throat> tracking tracking um, inspection sidewalk inspections and how are we tying that into the to oh Katie, Katie. probably for you and how are we turning it into the 
uh, deposits? Are we are we returning? Are we making an effort to return more deposits or? Sure. Um, you know, we, we knew, we've known for a while that the sidewalk deposit process has been one of our most challenging. We heard loud and clear during the hearing last year about it. Um, so we've made quite a few improvements um, over the course of this last year. We have moved the request process online for the return of those deposits. Um, and uh, that includes a tracking mechanism so that when you request an inspection of your sidewalk, you can track the process through um, that on new online tool. We are providing technical assistance during construction so that we're getting a better um, first quality repair to those sidewalks so that we're Which more likely. Which is why a lot of the, the um, throw on a blank, Katie. The deposits weren't coming back because they weren't built because, to the specs. Exactly. They would fail the inspection, and so therefore we weren't able to return the deposits. So as we're getting better quality moving forward, we'll be able to return more of those deposits. Um, we have developed clearer guidance during the permitting process where we're clear about both what the process is to get your money back, but also what you have to do to build the, the sidewalk right in the, uh, the first time. And we're now working on developing a contract where um, any uh, deposits or any inspections that have failed multiple times or people who forfeit their deposit can then, um, we can then go ahead and do those repairs. So um, so we, we're hoping that these are really successful changes to the process. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Asabi George. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of quick um, questions. I, I'm looking at my notes from last year and we spoke a little bit about um, the new utility poles and I had some questions about the design of the utility yes. poles and I'm, some of them aren't lovely, um, but I do know that we're getting, can we talk a little bit about the revenue that we're collecting from those? What what are we getting on them? Sure, so uh, I believe do it will have the, that revenue goes into our Department of Innovation and Technologies uh, line item. I will say that with great credit to Kathy Garcia uh, and Mike Donaghy, we're spending a lot more time uh, ensuring that uh, those telecom providers, when they are putting a pole on our streets, are actually living up to the requirements of our contract uh, about when they go in, that they're maintained appropriately, uh, and that uh, sort of any of the work around them, the removal of the previous poll, for example, is all taken care of in a timely manner. Um, and just a general effort to better manage this. We are actually also adding a new staff person to street lighting who will focus specifically on uh, this issue. So what is, um, what is that revenue? Those um, polls. I, I can get it from, we'll get it to you from Do It. It's, it doesn't go into our budget, unfortunately, so I don't know. Oh, because it goes, in, it yeah. goes into Do It's right, budget. I get you. Um, have we had complaints or um, issues with any of the polls? Some of the ones, especially with the larger base, Correct. Um, when they're up against a corner or close to a corner, appear to impede some of the ADA issue, compliance so, issues. So the, they have to uh, uh, follow all ADA uh, standards, uh, and that is one of the things which we want to inspect for to make sure that these companies, when they are putting them in, are, are following uh, uh, all of the appropriate uh, guidelines. Um, the, um, in addition to that, there are multiple options that they have. You can either put the, that large so they can either have a large base or they can mount many of those radios sort of higher up on the pole. And so we're working with them about what the right type of design is for the right locations in our city. And then obviously the height on those boxes, because that's another concern that I've heard um, over Correct. the last year. And then the thoughtfulness about placements of the poles, especially on residential streets. Yes. Um, in front of somebody's home, public sidewalk, but in front of somebody's home as opposed to in an area of the street that is... Yep. It could be not in front of somebody's house. There are there are some limitations that we have due to sort of federal requirements, um, which we can sort of dive more into depth uh, on. But it, we there's only so much discretion that we have about where something necessarily can be. Um, but we do have an opportunity to make sure that they are following sort of all the design standards which they are putting out, and that to the extent possible, we're making those bases smaller, and that we are making the designs more attractive. We uh, are sympathetic to your your feedback about Great. this. Great, thank you, and I appreciate that. And then last. Um, We've uh, done a good job, I think, over the last year of laying down some more bike lanes across our city mm -hmm. and a few more protected bike lanes mm -hmm. or fully protected bike lanes. One of the concerns that came up over the winter, although it was a low snow winter, was some of the snow plowing in those bike lanes. Can we talk a little bit about um, those efforts? I actually think they were, I think we did a great job this winter at really, uh, really being able to maintain those, those bike lanes. Credit not just to the new equipment, but obviously to Mike's team for all the hard work they put in around this. Right. So and how many miles now of, of bike lanes or protected bike lanes do we have? I, 
We'll get you that specific number tomorrow, but I think it's three and a half right now, probably around six and a half by the end of the year. I'll get you the, I'll get you the specific tomorrow. And, and we've got the equipment. We do. So, so we keep adding to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. We did deem this winter um, a success as far as we took more steps forward than we took back. Definitely. Um, we maintained in snowstorms, which is, which is pretty interesting. I, was, I spent some time on Beacon Street at 2 in the morning and watched bobcats just run Beacon Street instead of a snowstorm during that 13 and a half, 14 inch snowstorm. Um, but, it, but I mean, it's, we hear that complaint more than we hear any other complaint now about our snow work. Um, so we're constantly trying to, you know, move the needle a bit more. But again, it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. We've got, I think now, now I would say about seven to eight dedicated small snow um, pieces. Um, and we're able to also get them in now from the contractors as well. So we're kind of thinking, we, we've got a thought process now in snow that is, if I can just say, you know, schools, ambulances, and bikes almost. So it's, 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 it's up to priority. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Ciamo. Um, just a couple of quick follow-up questions for the sake of time. Um, can we get a list, a full list of all of the contracts where we contract the work out to an external <coughs> provider? I know there's some lists in here for contracts over $100,000. I could care if it's 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, a subsequent list that names, um, and there's a, a, a small list in here for those folks who are minorities or people of color, women, mm -hmm. um, that would be great. Um, and then just some follow-up questions specifically on specific, mm -hmm. some specific projects in the district or near the district. Um, New England Ave, mm -hmm. there was some funding there. Where are we? What's happening? Council is soon to be under construction. Okay. Um, and that would be soon. What's the time? What's the time? Oh, uh, within the next couple of months or so. Awesome. Okay. It has been advertised and okay. it's happening this summer. Um, Awesome, and then Cummins Highway, just, I know there was one meeting, where are we with respect to Cummins Highway? Cummins Highway, it's a new project, uh, when I say new within the last yep. 12 to 16 months. Uh, we've started the community process, we are very encouraged with the amazing feedback we got from the community, and uh, we are anxious to take that project to at least 75% design over the course of the next year. And that's, um, what's the proposed number for that? It's or at least in this budget cycle. I don't think I actually have that in front of me. Give me a second, Councilor. It's four in total. That's four million in total. Uh, that's currently authorized. Yes. Okay. Um, some of the other projects, I think, are more questions, frankly, for BTD. Um, and then a couple of things. We were talking about sidewalks, sidewalks earlier, raised sidewalks, painting, striping. Um, you know, we came across this beautiful young lady. I think she was like 10 years old. The paint that presents as 3D, which was really cool versus raising a whole sidewalk. I thought it was a great idea. What do you guys think? Sure. So we recently published sort of a set of uh, painting guidelines for painting yeah. on the street. We have done a few street murals, uh, including uh, there will be a new one painted tonight on Arboretum Road, uh, just off of Washington Street. Um, I would say that uh, for safety reasons, the, in general, we are focusing at places that are separate from things like crosswalks or lane markings, things that are clear traffic control devices. And so where those street murals are happening tend to be sort of slightly separate from those locations. Yeah, I mean, one thing, you know, D4 often gets a bad rep. People like to focus on Mattapan and Dorchester for the negative things. But, you know, street murals and TNT, for example, totally. right near Southern yeah. Ave, the young people are painting, yep, they're doing exactly. innovative things, and then everyone else is like, that's great, I want to steal your idea. Um, but I think the idea around, um, that young girls, the paint exactly. presenting as 3D was so cool, it's so innovative, um, probably cost a lot less money than some other um, more extensive and invasive proposals. So I'd be curious where you could pilot some things like that in certain communities that have complained, maybe around schools, um, about needing to do a little bit more to slow traffic down. Um, so I can continue that conversation yes. offline. Yeah. I think we tweeted at you, but that's not really the best way to, to communicate, frankly. Um, and then uh, some, what is our strategy for, I mean, we obviously have a lot of spot fixes we do. We, we get people calling all the time. Um, some streets are worse than others. Um, what's our sort of overall strategy and response? Um, do you, yeah. Do you mean specifically on sort of roadway resurfacing? Exactly, exactly. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a tough. It's tough. It is. It is tough. Um, so we un we know the condition. We assess the condition every year of all of the roadways in the city and track that. Um, so we we know what list of street candidates are our best resurfacing candidates. Um, once we have that list, we go through a process with the utilities to determine where they have planned work so that we always come in after them. So we don't have them digging up a street right after we've paved. And that's the part that takes the longest um, and is, is probably the most frustrating to all of us mm -hmm. because at that point you know you've got a street that needs to be paved but you're, you can't pave it because you're waiting for something else to happen. So um, the changes that we're putting in place this year, uh, we're putting in a uh, selecting a new coordination tool that should assist us in sort of moving the program forward. Um, and we're also working on creating a longer term paving program so that we can work more proactively with the utilities to, um, so that we're able to schedule together rather than necessarily waiting for them. Um, generally though, we are viewed, the city of Boston is viewed as having one of the best utility coordination um, programs in the country. So uh, what we're doing is looking to make our processes better. Um, so. No, it's very helpful and, um, you know, Katie, applaud you for the work that you're doing. Um, and quickly, I guess I'll end on this note, you know, applying that sort of equity lens to the work. I think I first heard it from you, what it even means to apply it in a design fashion and you presented last year and I was like, that's amazing. Um, didn't know what half of what you were saying, but now I do. Um, so I'd be curious, what does it actually look like in practice? So we were talking about the number of calls that come from some neighborhoods, maybe not the same number as other neighborhoods, but it doesn't mean those folks don't care. They could just be really busy or some have just given up on government. Um, so what does that look like in applying it to your work? Because I think there's something to be learned, um, learned there, particularly when you look at all the sidewalk changes and the handicap ramps. Um, people see that, they notice that, and of course we're yelling and screaming, well that's government working on your behalf. Um, so I'd be curious what that actually looks like um, as you sort of did this process. Absolutely. So, um, so it's been a really uh, successful first year of putting the equity lens on our sidewalk program. Um, we identified uh, three or four hotspots in the city that had extremely poor condition sidewalks on the major thoroughfares, or sort of the the, the most important pedestrian connections, and also the. Um, the populations that had the highest social vulnerability. So where were those places where we had sort of the intersection of social vulnerability and poor sidewalk condition? And we've targeted our um, sidewalk replacement investments in those areas. So we completed our first location this last year in uh, Roxbury and sort of the Garrison Trotter and Sugar Hill neighborhoods. Um, we have got work coming up in the Glover's Corner, mm -hmm. sort of Savin Hill Dot Ave area this year. Um, and then, and then a couple more coming up. We've seen an increase in, um, I believe, about $3 million in this budget um, in that program. Well, I just, I mean, want to commend you guys again. It's, it's incredible. And, you know, what you're not naming is just all of the side streets, the residential streets where people have seen tremendous work on their sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, public works, you guys are... I think everyone said, says this, by far one of the best departments to work with in terms of constituent services, getting things done. You make our jobs very easy. Um, so thank you again. And to folks who couldn't be here as well, please extend our gratitude um, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Senior. Council Romali. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will also begin uh, echoing uh, the Council President. I, I said in my first line of questioning, it is true, and, and Katie and Chief Para, Mike, you guys do a great job leading an incredible team. Special shout out to Eric Prentice, uh, April Maldonado, Dennis Roach, and uh, Freddie Mycroft, who runs uh, the District 6 Yard. Um, just incredibly talented and responsive uh, public servants. And I think you know the importance of your work, and you do it exceptionally well. I think DPW is um, really stronger than it's ever been, and I commend you all for your great work. Um, I'd, I wonder, you probably don't know this off the top of your head, but I'm hoping that we could, you could furnish us with the percentage of plastic that's in our single stream recycling picked up this year compared to the same time last year. Point I'm asking is when we were working on the plastic bag ordinance, uh, Casella had said they thought it could be up to 20 tons per month of plastic. Now I know that's just not all plastic bags, but uh, I know anecdotally we've seen a decrease and I'd love to just get what those numbers are. So Casella does do regular audits uh, and we can pull out from that, I think something which is close to, if not the exact answer to that question. Great. I will say, anecdotally, what we've heard from Casella is that there are fewer plastic bags that are 
uh, themselves that are ending up in the recyclables, which has a, a big impact on just the operations of their, of their overall system. Absolutely, because I would always argue during the deliberations over that ordinance that we were paying for plastic bags without uh, you know, directly seeing it, so this has been better. Um, in some of the uh, capital budget uh, power that's sort of been illuminated, you talk about uh, various neighborhoods, uh, neighborhood commons and neighborhood commons, reconstruction of Center Street, that's Center Street in West Roxbury? No, that's the JP? JP. Yeah. The okay. Street, if you look at the VTD budget, you'll see the Center Street West Roxbury line. And that's, okay, that's the response. All right, so we'll save that for the next one. Great. So this, Kapara, can you talk a little bit about some of the JP redesign? I know that this has been um, in the neighborhood for quite some time, so it's exciting to see that we may be moving down the field a little bit. This is so, right, so Jackson Square, which, uh, which I mean, uh, Hyde Square, which High Parra, Square. Parra yep. led, uh, is wrapping up, and Katie's going to be working on sort of the, okay. the sidewalk work that, that connects to that. Okay. I don't know if you want to talk about Hyde yeah. Square. Hyde I, I Square is almost done, it I is believe. Done. Yeah, public so, art aside. Yeah. Just need that public art. <laughs> the public <laughs> art, that's right. that's right. Maybe this fall, Parra? I hope so. I hope so, too. <laughs> I do want to thank you, Par. I've, another, you know, in addition to the citywide uh, curbside composting, um, I've been talking for years about the Heat Street uh, stairs, um, which we had a wonderful ribbon breaking, uh, ribbon cutting last year. So, uh, and they're well, well used. It had been 30 years since those stairs were uh, last used. Um, okay, from the sort of macro to the micro. I wanted to use this opportunity to, again, um, my request on Johnson Street and West Roxbury and Orchard Street and Jamaica Plain for new sidewalks. Uh, I know that we've been working with the utilities on Baker and Brook Farm and West Roxbury reconstruction. It's been a while. Uh, do fl who, Chief, you do flower, the nice flower plantings in the median strips, right? Or is that Parks? Parks, Parks does that. Okay, I'll save that for Chief Cook. Um, how has the coordination been with some of the utility companies, specifically National Grid, as it relates to gas leaks and better coordination? I know something we all share. And um, Katie, do you want to talk a little bit about that? So I think the coordination is going really well, um, and it's kind of wrapped up in the improvements that we're making to our coordination process overall. Um, I don't have a status exactly on what the actual leak percentages are and, yep. and how the fix is. I am seeing a lot of requests to fix grade two, week, two leaks, so, um, so I do think that we're seeing some improvements. Okay. Uh, they, do they share that information with us yet? The number of the exact number of leaks and sort of. So I think it goes to the environment department. Um, okay. I have not seen it for this year. Just for those who may be in the audience or those watching, this is something that we codified in law. The mayor signed into law. Uh, there was litigation from National Grid, but we had sort of a mixed bag of success from the judge. So I'm hopeful that we can uh, have that information. Uh, it, I don't need to know it. I just need to know that you all and people who are working to fix it have it. Um, double poles, that's always been an issue as long as you're all smirking because you know this has been going on long before us and hopefully not too long after us. But talk a little bit about sort of efforts to address that. I think some of my colleagues may have brought that up. Talking about when there are two poles, one's off and off the ground, how do we sort of minimize that? It can be dangerous, it can be unsightly. Yeah, yeah. So, Council, as you, as you pointed out, it has been uh, an ongoing headache. Uh, we are working very closely through the Public Improvement Commission, uh, both Verizon and Insta, they are the uh, major, or between those two, they are the ones who own the poles. Most times, Council, the challenge is there are, through the Telecommunications Act, so many <coughs> other secondary parties have been allowed to be on the pole. I see. So when poles have to be moved, all those wires have to be, re wires need to move. And that's a very arduous process. So uh, the chief, through the Public Improvement Commission, we have repeatedly brought the offending parties to let them understand that it is a blight, it is a safety concern, and uh, we hope to get better results as we go along. And can I just ask, I know my time's up, but to that point, um, how are we dealing with sort of the 5G network, other cell towers? I mean, I am an AT&T customer. There are parts of my neighborhood where I get no reception whatsoever. I mean, how do we sort of address that? Sure. So there are five licensed uh, sort of wireless providers that yeah. are uh, really significantly building out the antenna network that Councillor Sabi George sort of had, had referenced, uh, and we are working with them uh, and working internally to figure out the right way to have a streamlined process yeah. that allows us to be putting things on the street that improve your uh, cell connection, 
um, but also do not cut into the roads that we are or minimize the number of cuts of course our roads and do so in a way which uh, still uh, keep a sort of attractive public streetscape that is a bit of a of course that we are sort of working through but we have a lot of uh, team members who are here who are focused on that there's a small piece of that which is actually connected to your double poles question Every time they're putting up a new antenna, they're taking down a, an old street light. We are getting that street light back. That's saving us, I think last year saved us around $270,000 of, uh, sort of, of assets because we had new we had street lights that used to be on the streets coming back to our inventory that we could redeploy in other places yeah. as those new antennas went Yeah, it, it, I mean, it is the right balance. We don't want to clutter the streets. It, it, it's not just my cell phone. It's the fact that the every individual <laughs> has four, five, ten devices that are Bluetooth enabled that, that to use significant amounts of data, so the impact is real. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to also turn to page 23, and when you, before you cut the deal with the trash company, um, I was just a little troubled by, on page 253, um, <clears throat> the actual numbers you gave for missed trash, trash requests. 12,706 in 17, up to 17,106 in 18, and the um, request completed on time percentage went from 97 to 79 percent. Just wondering, you know. Yeah, so I could, I can't speak to, to, to that dip to 79 percent. I don't, I, I want to recheck that data. Um, we, that's one of the f fastest things we do is yeah. handle a missed trash case. Never had a I problem. Just right. saying. Yeah, that, that, I think that's an anomaly. I would say that the that the number of missed trash cases could be spoken to every time we increase a stream. We yeah. added weeks of um, yard waste last year. Yard waste is the most common case created during those now mm -hmm. 20 weeks a year. Um, mm -hmm. That can that can add to it. Also, because what we've done too. It, what, two or three years back, we, we stopped picking up yard waste when it was put out on the wrong week. Right. That creates cases because folks right. want to say, you missed my yard waste. We didn't miss it. We're going to get you next week. And you get the calls, I know. Um, so right. a lot of those case spikes can be um, just towards that um, right. the, Okay. Yeah, and if you could get those numbers, I think it's useful to use them in any negotiation if yeah. they're oh, correct, most certainly. right? Most certainly. And I think we talked about yard waste last year is where no good deed goes unpunished because we actually expanded the pickups, but because it was like every other week, no one was paying attention. And uh, yeah. so I'm glad to hear you're also increasing the pickups, but you're also having these drop-offs. The drop-off so. site, um, we think, is kind of a small-town approach. Yeah. It, it allows people, on, and, and, and those weeks will be on the Right. on the non-collection weeks. Right. So the weeks where gotcha. you're not going to get you. So you can say to the constituents, you can really drop it off It's really every week for 42 right. weeks. Right. Um, is, is it also uh, D4? Is that a... a no, a, it, no, it'll all be brought to our um, our site on American Legion Highway. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So someone would have to go from Brighton to American Legion Right now they go nowhere. So the, yeah, so, no, so, I know. Yeah. But it... it I'm, well, I'll put it this way. I'm not going to... I'm going to say wait a week. Sure. I'm not going to tell sure. them to go to... Sure. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, they can... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, and then just shifting um, to um, Katie, I guess. Um, Eversource is wrapping up or has wrapped up that huge um, substation project, and obviously they ripped up a lot of uh, streets and sidewalks uh, through their process. And they're on Faneuil Street. They're, they're bombing through it. Um, but I haven't, uh, and I've been in touch with um, Eversource about the timeline for Parsons Street, too. Have you, do you have any info on that? I don't have an update on Parsons, but their, re um, their uh, agreement with the city is that they will reconstruct those streets the same way the city was planning on right. doing it before they started their project. And they have notified us that they're ready to get started on that reconstruction, so the, the paving and, and any other remaining sidewalk replacements. So that right. should be happening this summer. Okay, great, a a including Parsons, I right? I believe so, yes. Okay, great. Um, and, and then <clears throat> I'm going to preface this because I, oh, Matt O'Malley left, good. Uh, <laughs> no, because I, um, I was recycling before recycling was cool. But, however, I think there comes a time when if we're paying an exorbitant amount, you know, when does the cost-benefit kick in that it doesn't make sense because of either pollution from all of the large trucks that we use to, you know, when do we look at that and say, because to, to uh, Councillor O'Malley's point, a lot of municipalities now are just lumping it all in, which, you know, I don't want to get there, but... 
at some point it becomes cost prohibitive, possibly. Sure. I mean, without question, the costs have gone up. I think the, the, the case for recycling and composting is still that these are things that reduce natural resource extraction and can lower emissions, which are two I think, goals that we all share. Right. Um, I, th I think one of the reasons why it is great that we are I think, still investing so heavily in recycling, even as we see the costs go up, uh, is that it ensures that that market continues to develop. Part of what we're going through right now mm -hmm. uh, is a huge shift in uh, sort of the way in which recycling is processed and where it is processed mm -hmm. and who the downstream, uh, sort of the downstream market for it. If more municipalities step away from recycling now, I don't think that future market's going to develop. Right. And so now is a, it's really important that we actually continue to invest at this particular point in time, right. uh, even though I agree with you, the costs have gone up very right. significantly. I mean, and obviously we, the, the major city in the state, exactly. we're sticking with it. You know, we we kind of have the wherewithal. I see we're smaller towns, but yes. if I, I think we need to keep an eye on that, that's all. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then Frontage Road, I just uh, wanted to ask about <clears throat> the timeline. Obviously, it's been delayed for this study. Uh, we're talking about eight, is it 17, 18 acres, Chris? Roughly, yep. Um, and obviously, we have some very needed uh, city services yes. located there. They don't necessarily all have to be there, but it is centrally located. Mike was great enough to <clears throat> arrange some great tours. Yep. And, uh, you know, just to weigh in, I might not be here by the time you get to it, that's why. Um, the outskirts of that site is Amtrak, right, on the very edge of where the channel meets our plot, correct? On the, on the east side, uh, it is, there's a commuter rail line and a, uh, and a further on down sort of an Amtrak facility. Right, and, and obviously, our land or our lots go up to the, some line Correct. there. Yeah. So we can't really even touch that, right? So, you know, I just want to put this out there publicly. You know, I believe that, you know, it may play a role in, um, you know, preventing further erosion of that area, but it shouldn't be the be all end all of how we save our city with such a valuable, valuable site. And I want to uh, make sure that the district city councilor especially get some deference on that um, because it is his district and he's hyper focused on it and I think it's an opportunity that can do a lot we can do some climate activity but also do the uh, you know I, I just see this is a Winthrop Square all over again mm -hmm. a great opportunity for our city to maybe go and partners, get those environmental studies through an RFP with private developers rather than our own resources. So I think we should shift, you know, after this report's completed, I hope I am still here. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say. Councilor Baker. You don't have to leave. Well, I <laughs> oh, guess you do sorry. now. <clears throat> oh, you know what? I'm sorry, Councilor Baker. She yeah, that's right. Back. Councilor Edwards. <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank sneaky. I know. In and out. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to uh, follow up on some of the um, uh, the questions I'm sure some of my colleagues asked about the replacement of the trash barrels. I know you did a great um, job last year in getting to some of them in East Boston. We're still wondering the open top ones that are just, you know, very tips, sure. the tipsy, tipsy ones. Yeah. What is the progress or can we identify so, some more to get replaced? Yep, and, and we're actively doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the tipsies are the bane of, you know, our good work. Um, we see the trash come right up behind us sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so we are doing that. We actually, did, we actually just deployed um, eight to ten Victor Stanley style inside of the North End after a, a joint conversation with some civic leaders over there. Um, and we put them in some targeted spots that they had wanted them. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to do, put down eight. We got Parks Department to put down two more, so, so we hit the bulk of their list. But we are looking at the city as a whole um, to work through that old inventory. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've got some pricing models and some ideas that you know, we, can, we can look forward to in the future. Excellent, and we were, um, were you, are you referring to the replacing the ones in the Prado in the North End? That or? was part of it. That okay, was part of excellent, this, yeah. excellent, because that was one of my, my follow-up questions. Um, in terms of the, um, with continued, uh, I guess, pick up our infrastructure, you know, in East Boston we have this, one of my constituents, he's created an app, actually, uh, that allows for uh, folks, you sign on to the app, you clean your street, you note that you cleaned it, and then uh, it turns colors to remind you to come back and clean your street. Um, so it's, it's part of the organizing of, you know, folks to come together and whatnot. Um, 
so there's two, two parts to this question. One, to bring that up. Two, to note that you were, um, your department's vital in helping them. Thank you so much. They had come together and they needed some materials, some pokers, some gloves, and so on and so forth. And you guys said absolutely, so they wanted to thank you. But also wondering how we can enhance um, and those kinds of resources and coordination. Uh, they want to do it. They're out there doing it. They think it, you know, they only do it on the weekends, not to supplement or not to replace yeah. city services, but to continue on them. It's building community. I'm wondering how we can continue to grow with that. Me, I, think, yeah. I think just that. I think I think just just what occurred, whether it, whether it was you connected them to us or if they had a different avenue. Obviously, as you noted, and they noted to you, we're, we're willing partners. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the supplies. Um, we put in a lot of manpower in, in hours into doing our own work, mm -hmm. um, but, we're, but we're always helping. I mean, this past weekend and this future weekend here, um, coming up, love your block. Um, is a is a is a big deal to us, mm -hmm. um, and we support it fully, and would support yep. many love your blocks throughout the year. Thank you. Um, my my last question, and it may not uh, stay in this department, is with regards to graffiti. Is that with you guys? Depends on what is what the graffiti is on. But oh, okay. Property well, so, what does it need to be on uh, so for you guys? Basically, street light or on public the property. Public, public property. property. Okay. Um, so, I talk to me, I guess, about your process for removing it, but I think. The ones I have complaints are about are probably on people's homes. So, but tell I me think that's bit. probably the so publicly, case comes in. We I think um, under the leadership of Norman Parks, we're able to turn around a public um, graffiti case within three four days. Um, okay. It's just it's it's simple paint. Um, sometimes we do um, power washing efforts in some areas. The private piece that you're talking about is a bit more cumbersome. Um, it's under um, property management. Mm -hmm. And it and it takes a letter of notification. It's it, it has to come back in so they can properly and be allowed to touch that private property. Okay. Um, but 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 our public stuff is a pretty good turnaround time. Unfortunately, it becomes redundant. But um, mm -hmm. but but the private piece is, is uh, far more burdensome as far as the timeline. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks, Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Chris, you talked earlier about a, the, the state's the state's license, a supersede license. Is that the state? superseding the city of Boston's Conservancy and Quincy's, or that's just a third license we need? It is a, it's what's called a superseding order of conditions, which basically would be an order of conditions that supersedes what the Boston Conservation Commission or the Quincy Conservation Commission would have put in, or did put in place. So we're pursuing voted. that. Correct. That's a way for us to that's do correct. what we need to do. Okay, that's good to know. Emergency employees, Chris, what are we, who are they? What are we using them for? There are 650,000 which was an increase of about 166,000 a day. Is that labor or is that, um, who are those? Yeah, seasonal. Seasonal Hokies for the most part, I believe, yeah. Oh, cool, good, good. And Chris, I've talked to you about this labor. We need the labor, the, you know, shovel in the streets. It's how, we could, it's how we could generate people that could come into the public works at that initial, initial step. We talk a lot, a lot about putting people to work. We should be doing it ourselves, so um, thank you for that. Mike, will you talk a little bit about you? You had mentioned earlier that everything comes in on 311. Is it? Is there an informal memo or a memo or just word going down that that we're not to communicate with your department? Is that is that okay? Like oh, calling people within departments? Yeah. Um, as far as counselors? Uh, yeah. Anything? No, I I've received phone calls often. I think oh, I know you do. I know you yeah. do. But what about? People lower down, are they? They 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 should be taking your calls. They and work emails for us. And, yeah, yeah. Okay, because um, I did ha I did have a situation. Not just your department, different departments. A lot of people are looking at their phones and three one one it. Drive me up a wall if I'm calling somebody about a situation. Yeah. It's probably already been three one one, and not every situation can three one one. So, it, it, people in departments should know that. And I'm only speaking for myself. If I'm calling or my office is calling, they're to respond to me. So if you could trickle that message down. Chris, if you could trickle that message down, that would be helpful to me. Um, 311 is good, but it, it isn't the end all be all. We still need to be, we're, we're in the business of people here, myself, you guys are also, um, and, and, and we're here to provide a service to the people of the city of Boston. So if we as counselors are calling, we're not calling because we want to call. We're calling because we have constituents that are making us call and following the 311. So, and that's, that's my message to, to all the departments that are coming in now because I'm, quite frankly, if another person tells me to 311 something, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your hearing today, Chris. Thank you. And, and your team. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Councilor Savi George, you're also. Great. Well, I think it's been said many times. I think sometimes we take the public works for granted, a lot of us. Um, you know, 
our trash, our roads, our sidewalks, our bridges. Uh, you guys do a great job, um, and I just want to thank you for that and adjourn the hearing. Thank you. Hi. Should I do the gavel? <laughs> All right. Am I good to go? Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Christiana Lacusa. Um, I live at Six Evergreen Square in Somerville, um, but I work for Liverpool Streets Alliance, um, and I just wanted to thank you for allowing us to share comments today. Um, so, you know, as I'm. You've gotten lots of praises today, but we also want to acknowledge that D DPW is a critical group and really doesn't get enough credit for the wide variety of tasks, of key tasks you all take on. However, there are some areas that we think could use with some improved efficiency and more robust interdepartmental communication. In terms of efficiency, and comparing the FY19 and the FY20 budgets, we noticed certain projects that had zero dollars spent in FY19 and are now being proposed to receive funding again. Those include Ruggles Street and Columbia Road. While it's important to ensure funds are available to take on projects, it's also important to move projects forward and to understand what's holding projects back. So we would like to understand why the implementation has been delayed on these projects and what is being done to ensure these projects are started this fiscal year. We are happy to see the city investing in signals. However, we're curious what the policy is around what these signals are trying to accomplish. Um, there are already a couple of bus lanes throughout the city with more being planned. Will these new signals be paired with projects to allow for transit signal priority? Will retiming consider the needs of pedestrians and cyclists? The pedestrian phase on a number of intersections across the city is really too short to allow safe crossing for people with mobility challenges. Um, my last point has already been addressed a couple of times and um, by, brought up by some of the councillors, um, but I also wanted to point out there that there are a number of corridors and intersections that we have observed BTD and DPW to be out of sync. I point to the intersection of Blue Hill Ave and Warren Street as one example. This past fall, DPW repaved and repainted the intersection. However, this is an intersection that has a number of problems, ranging from being a bus bottleneck, pedestrian crossing times being too short, bus stops needing a plan for better ongoing maintenance, and the need for additional no turn on red signage to prevent pedestrian conflicts, to name a few. This maintenance project could have been an opportunity to, to address some of these challenges and link with the larger Go Boston 2030 project for improving Blue Hill Ave. This section will undoubtedly have a number of additional changes that may undo some of the work done over this past fall, and we would like to raise concerns over the lack of cohesion between departments. We hope you can address these questions and concerns, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and I'm sorry I no problem. skipped it. <laughs> now this hearing is adjourned.